um uh, and this uh, as we all know, the success for this ABDM initiative depends on uh, the collaboration with the stakeholders. And uh, happy to share that we have about uh, 73 plus entities who have uh, successfully completed one or more, more than one milestones, where a figure of 20 plus is for the entities who have completed all the three uh, milestones and they are uh, com uh, uh, all compliant with ABDM functionalities. Uh, many of these entities have also, in fact, gener started generating and linking the health reports on ABDM live environment. Uh, details for these uh, will be available on uh, a sandbox dashboard, ABDM real time dashboard, that is dashboard.abdm.gov.in. So please feel free to visit the uh, link. And uh, also, some of our integrating partners have been uh, extremely supportive in adoption of ABDM by helping with integration process for other partners, uh, helping us resolve uh, uh, new queries which we face. So taking this trend further, we have today uh, Hitachi MGRM team who will walk you through the uh, uh, milestones M2 and M3 APIs and other points. So this work, content of this workshop we have designed totally from the uh, integrator's perspective, you know. Uh, we will not follow the completely the documentation part. This is completely designed from the integrator's perspective uh, so that, you know, it will help you understand the uh, basic terminologies, what we have, we, what we use in M2, M3, some of the mandatory workflows that need to be implemented and what are the some of the basic challenges, you know, which an integrator faces in the integration process for especially for M2 and M3. Uh, I also take this opportunity to uh, request the participants to uh, uh, actively participate in Dev Forum. It is an open forum which, uh, uh, which is uh, there to discuss the integration issues. It is basically a platform to collaborate better with all the ABDM stakeholders. So I request you to actively participate uh, in this uh, Dev Forum. Now I invite uh, speakers from Hitachi to take this workshop further. So um, just uh, before uh, Sai and Ranveer, I would request you to also introduce yourself. So before we go further, just a few basic meeting etiquettes I would like to reiterate. Uh, please keep yourself on mute all the time. In case you want to speak, please use the raise uh, your hand feature and we would then unmute and then you can uh, proceed with your queries. But we also sincerely request you to keep all your queries for reserved for the uh, uh, later in the session. We have uh, specifically um, uh, defined some time for Q&A session. And also please do mention your name along with the entities you represent. That helps us to... Uh, uh, to trace and revert with your queries uh, more efficiently. Um, and of course, I re uh, repeat that this session is being recorded and the recording would be uploaded on the Sandbox webpage. Even the, uh, the uh, workshop for M1, which we had earlier taken on 24, so that is also recorded and the recording is now uploaded and available in Sandbox uh, webpage under resources menu. Uh, and in case of any queries, uh, do keep a note of it. We will definitely take all your queries at the end of session, or you can put it in chat. Uh, that is all uh, right now from uh, my side. Thank you so much. So Sai and Ranveer, can you please uh, take forward this one? Sure, sure. Thank you, Vinashi. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are, Ranveer. Ranveer, Sai, could you have your uh, camera also? So, uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, the speaker can identify easily with the speaker. All right. Uh, my camera is uh, not functional at the moment. I'm so terribly sorry for that. Uh, yeah. Ranveer, if you can switch on your camera, that would be good. I think your mic also is uh, facing some issues. Uh, not able to hear you clearly, Ranveer. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Ranveer, there is a lot of interference. I think if you can remove your charger, it will be good.
Yeah, there's a lot of interference, it seems. Can you? Are changing your headphones? Yeah, can you get on a different mic? All right, before Ranvi joins, uh, um, hello everybody. Uh, today we are conducting this ABDM workshop, which is organized by NHA and being facilitated by HMN, where we are going to discuss uh, milestones two and three. Um, and these have to do with uh, building the HIP and HIU systems in the ABDM ecosystem. And you also see that it's an implementer's perspective. Um, meaning that we are not just going to stop at discussing, okay, this is the flow and these are the particular API calls. This is the API sequence that you have to follow. Uh, but we are also going to look at uh, certain practical aspects and uh, abstractions that would help you as an integrator in, uh, in uh, understanding the flows and uh, achieving and building uh, the aspects in M2 and M3. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so who are we? We are uh, Hitachi and we are MNET. Uh, we architect and uh, we uh, provide solutions to various uh, sectors in India, both public and private. And we work across various domains, predominantly in healthcare and uh, education. And uh, uh, my name is Sai. Uh, I'm product leader and software architect. And uh, uh, at HMN and its uh, sister company, MGRM. I work across various domains uh, and predominantly right now I'm working in healthcare. And today with me, I have uh, Ranveer, who's uh, one of my colleagues and product engineers in my team and who would be assisting in demonstrating the flows and the theory that uh, we discuss. Uh, so with that said, uh, today, uh, like we have an agenda planned for you in uh, different steps, uh, starting with the first step, the foundational prerequisites here. We're gonna discuss like, what are the bare minimum things that you need to do to get connected to the ABDM ecosystem. And this is something that you have to irrespective of uh, what milestone you would be building, whether it's M1, M2 or M3. This is something that you have to do. You absolutely need as a checklist to uh, have that communication established with the ABDM gateway. And then we will straight up the bat, we'll start with patient validation where uh, we would look at the authentication flow uh, with a particular ABHA ID uh, when a patient walks in. And at the end of this, we would have the uh, patient's like access token, which we would use in the next step for linking care context. And how uh, we would do that, we would sort of look at like uh, the, varied steps in care context linking, whether it is HIP initiated or whether it would be patient initiated via the discovery initiated linking and what that entails, we will look into it. And towards that, we would uh, uh, look at uh, the data push aspect of it. Uh, as an HIP, uh, when you receive a particular consent notification against the consent, how exactly uh, and the, the steps that are needed for you to push the data. And uh, post this, we are gonna take a, sort of a detour and discuss uh, certain concepts on the data transfer. These include fire and the encryption and decryption aspects of uh, which are common across M2 and M3 for a data transfer because as in M2, as an HIP, you are pushing the data when you get a request. And uh, finally, we'll end it with uh, M3 data transfer where we start the request cycle and we'll receive certain data back and we'll decrypt it. And we're gonna uh, look at this whole uh, flow and that sets the backdrop for uh, the workshop today. So having that out of the way, uh, we're gonna follow a certain process, a certain flow for all these individual seven steps. We're gonna start with the theory as in what are the API sequence without delving too deep into why the things are the way they are, but like how they work so that uh, the core focuses on getting you uh, connected and running on M2 and M3. 
uh, at least from an understanding perspective. And then uh, Ranveer will assist in running the demonstration of the discussed API calls. And we will have a short interactive Q&A, just uh, scope to that particular uh, step in the uh, flow. So right off the bat, let's start, get started with the foundational prerequisites. So you see, uh, this is a, a high level architecture overview. Like there's a lot of, uh, when you look at an architecture diagram, like, there's a lot of fluff, but like what we are concerned with is that there is a facility, whether it might be an HIP or an HIU, and then there is the ABDM. So in between, there has to be something which would enable the communication between the facility and the ABDM uh, components. So this is something that could be a module that is built within your HIMS, or this could be a, a, a different service that is hosted like in a decoupled format and uh, where, which your HIMS can uh, communicate with uh, for communication uh, back and forth between ABDM and the facility. So there are, these are the certain um, flows that uh, will enable you to get started uh, to communicate with the ABDM gateway. Uh, at the behest, you need to have the client ID and the client secret, uh, which when you hit that particular sessions gateway. So here we have given uh, the base URL uh, and how it differs in SPX and in production. So uh, only the base URL changes for the sessions, uh, sessions endpoint. When you hit that particular endpoint with this particular body with client ID and client secret, it would return uh, an access token. And that access token you would use in the V1 bridges uh, URL, uh, wherein the base URL is like dev for SPX and live.abdm.gov.in for uh, production. And the GW in SPX is the, uh, I think, dev service and it's a gateway uh, in production. And you, you would hit it with the particular URL. So this is this URL would be the uh, callback URL that the gateway would use when it has some information to communicate back to you. Either uh, uh, it could be something that is initiated on the patient's end, or it could be something that's a callback uh, to a process that the facility you as, as HIP or HIU has initiated. And the headers would be, like you would be sending the authorization with the uh, beta token, the, the token that you, the JWD token that you would receive from the sessions. And whenever you see authorization in the headers, and that's what it means, you would be using the uh, sessions URL to get, to fetch that particular bearer token. And then after you establish this URL, this link between, if you can go back to the uh, slide above, uh, Ranveer. Yeah. So you can see that the link uh, between the HRP and the ABDM gateway is established by this particular bridge URL. So once that is established, this HRP, uh, if it's a service, not a part of a particular HIMS that is, or even if it's a part of a particular HIMS and if it's serving like multiple facilities, uh, actual facilities, it has to register them uh, as the services that are handled, managed, by this particular HRP. Uh, so for that, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the documentation, it mentions uh, uh, base URL gateway slash v1 slash services. But our take on this as an implementer is to use add update services. For one, it's a better API because uh, it's consistent in its behavior across SPX and production. And uh, uh, you can update your facilities also using the same uh, same link. So uh, we will shortly look uh, at the demonstration on how this particular uh, uh, API would be called. And before we go on to the demonstration, there is finally the get services uh, link. And uh, that get services uh, API endpoint would uh, uh, fetch all the services that you have registered against your bridge. And when I say bridge, I'm interchangeably using the terms bridge, the HRP, uh, uh, 
and these services you can like we will we'll look at in the demonstration on how these particular uh, sequence of steps will work and if you can uh, introduce yourself briefly and uh, then start the demonstration on the foundational prerequisites part of this right um i, I hope i'm uh, audible now yeah 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 you are right okay uh, so yeah hi hi everyone i'm ranveer um so uh, um, we can, um, I'm going to be giving the demonstration um, about the foundational prerequisite steps that I just went through. Um, so, uh, as it's, um, so on my screen, you, you can see our Postman collection, and I'll be using this to go through the different uh, demonstration steps that we'll be covering today. So, um, so for the foundational prerequisites, uh, we will be uh, looking at these uh, four APIs that I just covered. And um, the first one is, as he mentioned, um, the, the, the fetch uh, auth token API, which is the sessions API, which we will use to fetch the authorization token that will be used uh, for every subsequent API call that you make. So, um, and uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the body, we have client ID and client secret. Uh, we've abstracted these into environment variables um, so that uh, so that just for ease of access through this postman uh, postman collection. So um, as you can see, I've used the variables over here, and this uh, this this particular API has no headers for obvious reason because you don't have the authorization token yet. So um, once I hit this API, we can see we get the access token back. And just one thing, one quick note is that we have a test script that uh, saves this access token in, again, an environment variable called auth token, adjust again so that we don't have to copy paste it and it's easily accessible to this Postman collection. So um, after this, um, there is the register HRP host API, which is the bridges API, where, 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 which you use to register the callback URL. Um, so, uh, this callback URL, again, as I mentioned, is where we will be receiving all of the callbacks to the API calls that we make, uh, all of the correlation IDs, all of the data. So, um, the URL we are going to register is, uh, is on this, uh, on this tool called Pipedream. Uh, so, so you, just yeah. to give you a short intro, Pipedream is a service, uh, that we've used, uh, if you, uh, go back to the original webinars, there was a webhook site uh, that was used to demonstrate all the callbacks that we are getting. For the same purpose that we have received by dream also uh, but uh, if any of you here remember from the original webinars uh, in 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 those particular steps they were not able to demonstrate the aspects of uh, discovery initiated link because there were certain timeouts so with pipe dream additionally uh, we would also be able to add uh, uh, extra code steps so that we can automate certain processes so that we don't have to wait so that the timeout aspect of that instantaneous callback that is required by the gateway can be demonstrated and the, uh, the, the, the demonstration of the flow is complete. For that reason, we have used Pipedream and, uh, and it's, it's, it's fairly user-friendly also. So uh, we will be demonstrating how this works uh, shortly once we move on to the, the validation uh, step of that. Right. Yeah. Right, so um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, so a uh, quick thing in the headers of this API, we have the authorization token, which um, which is the auth token environment variable where the access token has been saved. So when I hit this API, we get a 200 OK. So the URL has been registered. Um, moving on, we also uh, uh, we also need to register the facility, which will be acting as the HIP or the HIU for this demonstration. So um, so uh, we will use uh, the add update services API that I was talking about earlier. Somebody so, asked a question, uh, is it the same uh, API as uh, slash even slash bridges slash services? No, it's not. It's a different one. And I think uh, the ABDM team has also shared the corresponding documentation for it. Right. Can yeah. you show the body like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm just getting to that. So um, the body of this particular API is, is an array and uh, each element in the array is an object which has the details about the HI, uh, with, about the facility that's being registered. Um, it, so, uh, it looks like save, right? Uh, the API uh, path only it was changed, I think. Add uh, in, the, in the slash services API, it's not an array. You only send the, uh, the particular uh, uh, object that you see the facility details object 
in add update services you change the you send the you can send like multiple uh, facilities as a part of your uh, call okay yeah uh, we will get we'll get to the question section as soon as the demonstration part of it is over thank you okay also okay. can you share that uh, uh, postman collection so uh, we would we would we would at the end of it like uh, uh, the abdm from someone from the abdm team will uh, get back to you we would share this with them and uh, they'll get back to you thank you yeah. okay thank you Right. So moving on. So we'll uh, we'll be registering a, a facility that we will be using today for the demonstration. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and change this. I'm gonna call it um, the ABDM uh, uh, workshop facility, and uh, we'll name it something similar as well. And uh, Right, act and the alias we're going to use the um, the same alias as the ID for now. The alias doesn't really matter for now from uh, what we've understood, but it's something uh, is required. It's not used anywhere, uh, but it's required. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, the header is the authorization token, and when I hit this API, we get a two hundred OK. And now we can validate that this facility um, has also it. register the HIU. Correct, right, right. So we can also register this as an HIU. So uh, as I said, we can use this API to update the details of the facility. So right now, when I hit this API again, it's not going to register a new facility. Just add an extra um, extra facility type to the same um, facility. So we can validate this with the next API, which is the Get Services API. Uh, again, in the headers, we have the authorization. Um, and once I hit this API, we get a list of facilities that have been registered against our client ID. And if I scroll all the way to the bottom, we can see that this ABDM workshop facility with types HIP and HIU have indeed been registered. So, um, so this, uh, flow work and, yeah. um, yeah, I think, I think with that, we've covered all four APIs for the foundation prerequisites. So uh, let's take like five minutes for a quick Q&A. And I think uh, we can start off with the first question uh, somebody posted on the chat. How do you ensure that there are no duplicate facility entities? Uh, so the uniqueness of the facility is determined by the ID. And uh, uh, so an ID can have like various types, HIP and HIU. And there, there's also a health locker, but that's like, that's something different and it's not a scope of this. Uh, presentation but the uh, id determines the uniqueness of the facility uh hie registration is needed uh, question from saju uh, it's needed if you are building the m3 uh, milestone uh, for if you're building an hie it's, it's required uh, for that and also uh, to like so that we don't forget when you whenever you're registering your uh, hrp you're given a client id and client secret please also uh, ensure uh, or like uh, from what, whoever your NHA uh, Spark is to uh, verify that what roles you're given for that particular uh, client ID. It could be HIP, just HIP that you wouldn't be able to build the M3 services. So you would have to get both the HIP and HIU roles for your client to build the HI aspect. Thank you. If there are any questions, no more questions, we can move on to the the second phase. Uh, hello. Is yeah. there any uh, uh, API uh, if I have ID of a particular facility, I can uh, which I can fetch name of that particular facility. So that is the get services uh, API that Ranveer has uh, uh, has showcased. Right now, it will give you the entire list of all the services that are registered under this particular bridge. So you can do a, like. You see so many facilities because we have used this particular uh, for extensive testing and for various purposes. But generally, in, in this in this particular list, you can run a simple loop to get what is the name for for the particular ID. Okay. Right. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> yes. Uh, any uh, access to validate that error log to us? Actually, we are facing a lot of problem. After registering the our callback URL, we are not getting any request hit time there. 
I mean, uh, I think you can test whether your uh, URL is set properly. I would suggest using. No, actually, we don't have any logs. No, is it uh, registered properly or not? What happened around this? Uh, if you on the register HRP host, if you get a 200 OK, that generally means uh, it is registered. And if you're still not, if you're still not sure that is it's registered, you probably drop a mail to the integrators team that uh, we have. A suspicion that this URL is not registered. So, but before that, to ensure that this is working, I would recommend that you use a site like webhooks.site or Pipedream to ensure that this bridge is uh, properly set up. And then probably that's an issue on how your server, which is a provision to receive the callbacks, is set up. If it's properly set up, it should work. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. After that, uh, we are we are not able to move forward. Actually, we uh, completed that uh, callback URL registration. Uh, we are com uh, uh, did, um, complete our uh, discover and non discover APIs, but we can't move forward because we can't able to uh, find out the logs what uh, going around it. Uh, by logs, you mean? See, suppose I am getting one request from Bridge. Mm -hmm. After that, I am uh, calling to on Discover API. Uh, I'm not but, sure that yeah. uh, I, I uh, think payloads it... and uh, everything is correct or what yeah. error is going on. The, those details I can't be able to find out. No. Yeah, I think for that, what is needed is uh, like. Uh... Uh, an understanding on the documentation part of it, because uh, I understand that there are certain ambiguities uh, when it comes to the uh, NHS like ABDM's documentation. Uh, but if it error uh, communication, they have done a fairly good job with communicating like what exactly is going wrong. At least they would send an error code. But if you're still not able to understand what is going wrong exactly, um, I think it would be better for you to write that in detail, the exact uh, steps that you have gone through and put that on the dev forum uh, or like mail them to your integrator uh, uh, point of contact at MHA and, uh, and that should help you out. And there is no other way, right? And there is, that is the way. Uh, that's okay. even that, yeah. To understand and like to infer the long process, right? No, I mean, uh, again, like to sort of reiterate the point on that, uh, it has to do like you have to go through certain hoops to understand the callbacks that are that you're getting, the what the request body is, and uh, that is the intent. One of the intents of this workshop to sort of take you through a pre-planned flow on from the first set like uh, of the APIs, starting from registering your bridge to the different aspects in M2 and M3. So I would suggest that you uh, follow this in its entirety on how things are set up in this particular flow. And if you still have any doubts and something is not clear, probably you can uh, communicate that in the dev forum, like uh, some of us like integrators can look into it. Uh, okay, thank how you. We can Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have this quick question here. Like uh, uh, in in this URL, you are demonstrating like uh, that URL is dev .abdm .co in slash dev services. In documentation, I found like it is instead of dev services, it is gateway. Like which one you have to use? Both are right. fine. Right. So the dev service is is for the SVX. I think the gateway should also work. They, they might have enabled it, but the dev service is the CM, is the gateway fragment. Like if you go back to the slides, there uh, we have given uh, probably uh, this thing is hidden by your. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so you can see uh, the bottom, probably this will be visible to you. Uh, once we give you the PDF version of the slide, uh, wherein you can see that in SBX, the base URL is this, and there is the GW path, like the gateway, the uh, the consent manager part, which sort of manages and orchestrates all the communication in the ABDM ecosystem. That is dev service in SBX, and uh, it is gateway uh, in production. 
So the gateway can also interchangeably work for some APIs like the the Bridges API or the Adobe Services API that uh, you've been uh, you've been using. But it's dead service. Like whatever works for you, that's uh, that's best. But the GWA is generally dev service in case of the sequence of APIs, and it's a gateway in in, in production instances for production instances. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. About can a facility uh, register with multiple HRPs uh, as HIP? Uh, because if a request uh, goes, request is al always made to an HIP, then which HRP this uh, request will be routed to? So from my understanding, that's a special use case. And for that, you have to specifically communicate with the NHA tech team. Uh, but like one HRP can, uh, the relationship is one HRP can facilitate communication with many different HRPs, right? Like with different facilities, the communication can happen. So no matter where, where the communication is happening, the communication interceptor at the facility end is always called an HRP. Whether it's a HIP or HIU, HRP is a module. It could be a service uh, wherein it would uh, intercept the request from the ABDM and they can and it can pass on uh, the specific request to the particular facility uh, based on the different headers, uh, uh, based on the XHIP or XHIUID header uh, that it has, or it could be a part of the facility software itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is that one HRP has connections to multiple facilities, not the other way around. Not the other way around. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we need to contact uh, NHA for it. Yeah. yeah. That's correct. All right, I think that's all the time we have for this particular section. Let, let's move on to the, all right. So like once we, we've discussed the foundational prerequisites and uh, to just summarize, these are the steps that you would follow no matter what you're doing with the AVDM uh, ecosystem. This is for you to get connected as a bridge. And, uh, and I think you've had a workshop uh, previously on the M1 aspect of it, where you create a health card of a particular patient you can walk in. Now it is the M2. So one of the first steps uh, in building an HIP is patient validation. So imagine a patient walks into your facility and uh, there is an operator on the desk operating your software HRP through whatever interface that's running. And they have to validate that this patient uh, if they say that they have this particular ID and we'll also look uh, at other ways through which a patient, a patient can share their ID apart from verbally sharing it. But once they do share it, uh, we would go through certain steps of uh, validation, certain sequence of validation. Uh, let's look at that now. Um, so the, the first uh, URL, so we also have a caller on the HRP end, it would send, let's say the, the, the patient box in and they share uh, this is my ab id so you are supposed to hit this particular endpoint slash v0.5 slash user slash auth slash fetch modes and uh, once you hit it irrespective of like uh, whatever happens you will get a 202 once the gateway acknowledges your request and uh, shortly after the abdm uh, on your registered bridge url it would uh, hit this endpoint which is uh, v0.5 slash uh, blah, blah, slash, blah, blah, slash on fetch modes. So in the on fetch modes, you will have the body, which would uh, explain what are the, which would sort of like list down what are the different modes through which you can authenticate this patient. And you would be picking one of those uh, authentication. So this particular process of uh, calling the HRP initiating a call and then the ABDM calling back, or in some cases, the ABDM calling and the HRP responding via a callback uh, is a constant pattern that you will see across different steps in M2 and M3. So in the body, you will have a request ID, which is a random UUID that you will generate. And uh, when the ABDM is responding, there are a couple of aspects that you need to sort of uh, take care of. One is that there would be a RESP attribute in the body that you can see uh, under the body. And there they would be inside the uh, inside that object, the request ID would be there against which 
the gateway is responding back to the HRP. Also, additionally, in the headers, the, the ABDM gateway will send you the XHIP ID. This is the facility ID with which you have registered your facility in the ad update services call. So in, in, in instances where your HRP is serving multiple facilities, you can base uh, which facility to send this communication to or which facility uh, or, or which facility to base off your process layer on. You can decide that using uh, the XHIP ID header. And once we see this in, 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 uh, as a part of the demonstration, it will become uh, more clear. Uh, but again, like, uh, the request ID and responding to that request ID and the headers, uh, of course, HRP will have authorization and X XCM ID. And one more point to note is that ABDM, which I have excluded it here for the sake of brevity, uh, is uh, that ABDM will also send an authorization header. And that authorization header you can use to uh, validate that it's ABDM who is communicating uh, you uh, the, the call by uh, breaking the uh, JWT down and like looking at the signature and ensuring that the key found in the signature is the same as the ABDM uh, public cert. That uh, uh, we are not, uh, that's not in the scope of it, but if somebody is interested, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to cover that also. Uh, so that is the flow for the fetch modes on fetch modes. Moving on, uh, in the, in the on-fetch modes, you would get the different modes that are available for a patient to be authenticated against. Uh, you would use one of those modes in the, the query. Of course, like, again, for the sake of brevity, I have uh, excluded the request ID, the timestamp, and everything else that goes in the body, but you will see the entirety of the body in detail uh, when Ranveer demonstrates this particular flow to you on Postman. Uh, you have auth in it, you would in initialize an authentication against that particular chosen auth mode with the corresponding header sent, and then you would receive a callback by ABDM on slash users slash auth slash on in it. Here you would get a transaction ID along with, if it's a mobile OTP based auth, you will also get a, a, an auth code of sorts. And uh, you would use the transaction ID in the next flow, wherein uh, you would, uh, which is like the slash odd slash confirm flow, you would use the transaction ID. And in the cred credential, you would uh, pass on the auth code. So the demographic attribute of it is, is only used for a demographic auth mode. So there would be in cases, for example, we uh, run our facilities at uh, rural places where the uh, walking in patients, they, they don't have access to a mobile phone. In such cases, you want to sort of want the flow to go further without uh, that being a blocker. In such instances, you will use the demographic auth mode and we will see in demonstration on how that works. But once the confirm call goes through, you have the on confirm. This is where you get, so in the, in the, in the confirm call, while you start the auth in it, uh, you would also specify a purpose. If you can go uh, up a slide, have we included that here as a part of the, right. So in the, in it, we would be sort of mentioning purpose as a part of the query. So the purpose is uh, like, it has either you uh, select KYC as purpose or link as purpose or KYC and link. So what they mean is, if you can go to the next slide, please. So what they, what they mean is if you uh, choose link as your purpose, then you would get an access token, just an access token, which you can use in the third step where you would have to link certain care contexts or like uh, the medical records that are generated. The metadata of it is linked to the gateway. And for that to be linked, you need this access token. And if you choose your purpose as link, this is where you would get it. If you choose your purpose as KYC, you would not be getting an access token, but you would be getting the patient profile information just so that like if you're just doing a registration and you do not have uh, the intention of uh, linking anything in particular, then you can just choose KYC. But most generally in all use cases, it's seen that you use KYC and link because you want the profile information 
if the patient is is new but if the patient is already registered and you don't need their profile then you can just choose link uh, so that you can save the access token for the next step of actions that would happen so that completes the patient flow additionally that is also uh, the profile share profile endpoint uh, this is the this is a different mode with which uh, uh, instead of verbally sharing the ABHA ID, the patient can walk in and they can uh, sh uh, they can scan a QR code and uh, that would automatically be communicated to the facility uh, in question. And there's also a token number system with uh, which it can be integrated into uh, the queue management system of your facility, which uh, Ranveer will demonstrate live with the uh, uh, he'll share his uh, mobile phone and he'll show you how that works also. And But the the, the pattern essentially remains the same. Uh, ABVM calls in this in this case, like this is a deviation from what we have seen so far where HRP is the one, H but when I say HRP, uh, it can be the facility HIP or the HIU, but HRP on behalf of your facility is initiating the calls. But here the, that pattern is reversed where once the patient uh, scans on a QR code, it's the ABVM which hits the your bridge, your callback URL with a slash profile slash uh, share, where in the body, the profile information is shared. And once uh, we receive it, it's uh, HRP's responsibility to uh, communicate the acknowledgement back by hitting uh, patient slash profile slash on share. Uh, and everything else essentially remains the same. So that in, uh, in, in its entirety covers this step on patient validation. So let's move on to the uh, the demonstration part of this. Right. Uh, right, so for the, for the validation part, we're gonna be using these set of APIs that I had just uh, discussed in detail, um, uh, these four specifically. So um, uh, we'll start straight away. So the first API that uh, we have to use is the fetch modes API um, to fetch the modes of a particular patient. Um, so if you look at uh, the headers, it has the authorization, uh, which is the, uh, the token you get by using the fetch uh, auth token API that we discussed in the previous uh, flow. And uh, we also have the XCM ID, which, um, which uh, for the sandbox environment is SBX uh, and, uh, and for the production environment, it's ABDM. Um, and I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the body itself uh, has the request ID, which is a randomly generated uh, UUID. So we're just using Postman's uh, inbuilt GUID function. Uh, we have a timestamp. And then the meet of the uh, call is the query or, uh, attribute, which has the, uh, the ID, which the patient uh, either verbally shares or you receive through other means like the share profile uh, feature. Uh, then the purpose is what I was discussing. So this can be KYC or link or KYC and link. And depending on what you choose, you'll either just get the access token or just the demographics or both. Um, and then you also have to have the requester, which is, um, which is the type is HIP and the ID is the uh, facility ID that you are using. Uh, we can also quickly show the environment where you have uh, set the facility yeah. ID. Yeah, so I was just going to go ahead and change that. So if uh, if I really quickly go back to uh, this and uh, just see the ID of the uh, facility we registered, which was um, ABDM workshop facility. So I'm going to go into the environment variable and change the facility ID to this so that um, that is the facility ID that uh, we will be uh, making these calls from. Um, right. So, um, yeah, so now uh, we are uh, ready to hit this API. And uh, once I do that, I get it 202 accepted. And um, and if I switch over to um, to the uh, to Pipe Dream, um, I'm going to open the callback, uh, the, the, this, the Pipe Dream site, which is the callback URL that, that we had given. Um, we will see that the the callback has in fact been received over here. So if I open the body um, and I look at the auth attribute and the modes, we can see that for this particular uh, ID, there's the demographics, mobile OTP and Aadhaar OTP modes available. And we can choose either of these uh, modes to validate the patient. So if I go back, um, 
to the Postman call. Uh, the next the next step is the init API, which is where we have to specify the mode that we will be using to validate the patient. So um, once again, the headers include the two uh, standard headers that we will be using in every API call, the auth, auth token and the CMID. And the body includes um, the query object where we will have, once again, the ID. Uh, I'm going to be using uh, my uh, SPX up ID. Uh, the purpose, which is KYC and link. And the auth mode, which uh, we will be uh, demonstrating with mobile OTP. But if, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you wanted to, you could use demographics over here or Aadhaar OTP. Exactly the way that it's shown over here. So it's mobile underscore OTP, Aadhaar underscore OTP. So that has to stay consistent. And again, the requester, which is the HIP and the ID. So um, once I hit uh, once I hit this API, we get a 202 accepted. Once again, we have received a callback, which is the on init uh, on init API call that the gateway has made. And uh, we can see that we have received a transaction ID. And on my mobile number, I have received uh, an OTP as well, uh, which we will use in the next API call, which is the confirm. Uh, the confirm API. Uh, and uh, over here, we will have to uh, enter the correct transaction ID, uh, which I will copy from here. And I will enter it over here. And then in the credential attribute, as Sai was saying, if we had chosen demographic, we would have to enter these three attributes of the patient, the name, the gender, and the date of birth. Um, but since we have selected mobile OTP as the auth mode, we can go ahead and remove this attribute altogether. And the only attribute we need in the credential body is the auth code attribute where we will put the OTP that I have received from my mobile number. So the OTP I have received is 268763. So 268763. And um, we've got the right transaction ID. And when I hit this API, we got a 202 accepted and I should have received a call back on uh, Pipe Dream, where we can see uh, we have the access token, uh, which will be used for linking. And then because we selected KYC and link, I also in the patient attribute have the KYC of the patient. So I have the address, the ID, the year of birth, name, everything. So, um, so that, is, um, that is the entire uh, validation flow for you. Um, and just to just to reiterate, had we chosen any other auth mode uh, and we'd selected KYC and link, uh, everything would remain the same except the init call. That's where you would enter demographics or the other ROT instead. So um, yeah, and uh, the last uh, the last step uh, or the last uh, API sequence that we want to show for validation is the share on share uh, and, uh, a couple of APIs. So. Uh, this is an alternate option, uh, as we had discussed, for a patient to share their uh, ARB ID instead of verbally sharing it. Um, for this, the HIP uh, or the facility needs to have a QR code generated. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to really quickly show you how to generate that QR code. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm going to use the PHR app to... Uh, uh, to, scan, uh, to scan that and show you how the share profile works. So um, I'm going to use this online QR code generator. So what uh, what you have to what you have to enter is is essentially a JSON which will have your HIP ID and your code. Um, so like I have this copy pasted. So over here we have to enter the correct HIP ID, um, which uh, sorry this should be not a URL. It should be even free text. Um, and we have to enter the correct uh, HIP ID, which I'll copy from our postman variable or the environment variable, which is this. And uh, we will paste it over here. And the code, uh, the code is something that uh, the purpose of this code is to differentiate different machines at a facility. So uh, like if we kind of imagine a situation where in a dispensary or in a clinic, you walk in and there are multiple counters where you can go and validate your ID. Uh, this code is to differentiate those machines or the operators who are using those machines. So at the moment, for this for the purpose of this demonstration, it doesn't really matter the code I put in over there because we don't have multiple machines and this is just a simulation. But in the case that you do want to differentiate those machines, this code has to be unique and can be according to whatever heuristic you decide as an organization or as a facility. 
So anyway, moving on. Um, I'm also gonna share the my phone screen so that you can see how um, you can see how uh, the share on share works. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen over here. Sorry, just give me one second. Um, right. Right. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go into um, the ABA app and uh, let me log in again. I think my session expired. Okay, I'm just going to enter the OTP. Right, so if I go into the patient profile, and I click on the QR code and select scan. Uh, and I scan the QR code. You can see the facility details show up as ABDM workshop facility. And uh, once I click on share, uh, so just a very quick note, once I click on share, uh, we, will receive a, we will receive an API call on our, uh, on our HRP uh, callback URL, which is pipe dream over here. But, um, and, and the facility is supposed to respond with the on share. We've set up pipe dream to automatically respond with the, with the on share, because there is a, there is a timeout aspect to this, uh, sequence of API calls as well. So I'll just show you, I have it on share and, uh, we can see we've got the profile share over here and on the app, uh, oh, sorry, you can't see my other screen, but I'll just quick, I'll show you. But you can see over here, it has successfully shared your details with the ABDM workshop facility. Your token number is 100. So if I switch back to my other screen, um, right, so, um, I think my screen is visible. Yeah. So over here, you can see the share profile came through, um, with the, uh, with the pro entire profile of the patient, we can see the HIP code that I'd, I'd, men I'd mentioned this here. And then the entire patient profile is here with the KYC and the demographics and everything. So, uh, and, um, more, the most important thing, the health ID has been shared. So this is an alternate way to, to, for a patient to share the health ID. And, uh, we automatically, um, I can really quickly, so this is, um, we can see over here that in the code, we've automatically uh, intercepted the share profile uh, API call and responded with the on share. Now the body of the on share has the request ID, the timestamp, it has an acknowledgement uh, with the status of success, the health ID you have to send it back and then a token number. So as I had mentioned, this token number is for queue based management. Uh, if your facility follows any sort of QMS, then you can use this token number um, to facilitate that process. So um, that is what the body of the on share looks like. And, and that is why, because uh, Pipe Dream automatically intercepted this API call and made the on share call, we saw in the mobile app that it, it acknowledged this API call and gave the correct token number, which was 100. So um, that is how um, this sequence of APIs work. And I think that that covers um, the entire validation. All right, let's uh, take questions for the next five minutes. Oh, hello. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I need to know that uh, in uh, first API, that's fetch mode API, uh, in, instead of ID, that is ABHA address, we can pass health number also. Yeah, you can, you can. If you can and, open uh, fetch mode. Another question is one, yeah. uh, that uh, for demographic mode, uh, I I'm receiving patient ID null uh, in the on confirm uh, API. Okay. Uh, so that is expected uh, behavior or it is an error in that API. 
So on demographic auth, because you already have the demographics, uh, I think that you don't get the demographic information back specifically for that auth. That is a uh, there is some uh, documentation on that also. You can refer to the sandbox documentation. So specifically, no, I'm getting back. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting back the uh, other information, but not patient ID. Yes. This one is uh, about your yeah ID that is under you. I'm not not getting this one in on confirm page. I see, but uh, uh, you'd have to check. Out. Okay, you'd have to check with the with, with uh, the NHA team. But uh, do you really need it though? Because uh, you are doing the auth confirm call where you know the ID already. Uh, if you're getting back everything else, it's confirming that uh, the patient is validated. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, uh, can can you show the QR? Uh, how to generate a QR again? Uh, like. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So um, it's the it's a very uh, straightforward process. So like, there is uh, you have to enter a JSON. Right. So, and in the JSON, uh, you have to have your, uh, you have to have two attributes, the HIP ID and the code. So okay. as I mentioned, uh, the important thing, uh, the more important thing I would say is the HIP ID, which you have to, uh, which you will just enter like this. You have the HIP ID attribute and your HIP corresponding HIP ID. And, okay. and the second, the second, uh, the, the, the second attribute is the code, which as I mentioned is, is in case you want to differentiate the the different kiosks, so the different machines that are operating at the facility. So yeah. it's a oh. custom code that you would send, and yeah. uh, this can be programmatically generated QR code in whatever language you are using. Right now, we are using a QR code generator tool, but yeah. uh, ideally, you would uh, generate it uh, programmatically in whatever stack, and you would display it uh, somewhere, like uh, either at the counter or uh, uh, elsewhere in your facility. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, like uh, once we once we uh, just uh, scan this QR from PHR app, uh, the API will be called right. The share API uh, by taking this HAP. Uh, That's, correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And correct. the second question is uh, there is also a mode uh, which is a uh, direct mode, direct auth mode. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like so, uh, so the direct auth works. Uh, the until the init part, it works similarly, right? And once the auth is initiated. Uh, the uh, the HR the uh, gateway sends an out of band token. Ranvi, if you can open the sequence diagram, the documentation, we can quickly cover that also. Yes. So that is something that you would use generally when you have to link an episode of care. Like we would talk about it uh, in detail uh, during the linking thing, but to quickly sort of cover it, uh, you would use that aspect when uh, you have to link. Uh, without any time specific uh, limitation, uh, if it's an episode of care, let's say inpatient care, then you would uh, you would you would use that to uh, link in that aspect. So in the I think it's in the auth flow. So basically, uh, there is a test case. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, where, where it's mentioned that it's test case three in the Excel, where it's mentioned that uh, you have to take access token from register uh, registration of ABA, and mm -hmm. if it is not valid, then you have to go for a, a demography auth. Uh, so demographic auth again is used when generally used when uh, for use cases when you do not have access to the mobile OTP, let's say, but you have so it's a it's a it's to facilitate the process of authentication going smoothly. Okay. Yeah. That is the direct auth. Yeah. That init. So what happens here uh, is that the, the until the init call, th this thing is there. Auth mode, you would select direct, and what happens is the user would get a notification on the PHR app, and okay. once that happens, the CM will uh, uh, you would get like the auth notify and uh, the gateway would sort of send a perpetual access, a perpetual access token so that you can use it for episode of uh, care uh, yeah. sort care yeah 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 uh, my question is that that uh, in the uh, on page mode yeah. uh, i'm not getting a direct uh, uh, direct mode as a auth mode in yeah. the, uh, that that's why that is 
I'm not getting that. So uh, direct is a special sort of an auth mode where uh, uh, I think even if it's not enabled, you can use it. But we okay, have right. don't take my word for it. No, uh, that's, we, that's, yeah, that's yeah. correct. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, you you don't uh, uh, direct is enabled like it's available for all patient, but they have to have access to the PHR. App. So uh, um, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Another uh, uh, and direct mode is available for other. Uh, patient register only, or it can be apply for mobile register patient only. Uh, so it, the patient validation is something that is irrespective of how the patient was originally registered. You can so this is a step again. The the linking step like once you use an access token with whatever auth mode uh, that has been established, whatever access token you get is a one time use thing. Like once you link the care context, you have to do the whole flow of validation again to link a different care context. Yeah, right. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just, uh, do, I think you have already built the M2 part, I think. Can you just uh, show it in a UI, like uh, how it is built, like uh, this link care, care context, how it was linked? This, we will we'll cover care context linking after this. Thank you. Uh, 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 hi, this is Har this is Harry here. Yeah. I just have a fundamental question. Right. The clear demarcation between M1 and M2 because on one of the sheets that was passed on to us, mm. the validation using the in it on in fetch on fetch was as mm. part of M1, right? But right. since we are going through this right now, is it for sake of continuity you are showing us that? Or? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so that's really again, part like, of M1. Yeah. This is a this is a mediator process wherein. To show you care context linking, I have to do an access token. Okay. And that access token is something. Can somebody mute their mic, please? There's a lot of disturbance if you're not talking. Thank you. Uh, so that mediator process is something that uh, uh, we are covering in here. And generally, they are, they are also part of the building HIP API set because without an access token, there is no care context link. So that it has to be covered again in and that's the reason why we are covering this here. All right, thank you very much. Sir, yeah. actually, I'm facing an issue regarding the implementation of a, a milestone two. Uh, so uh, when I uh, tested all the related APIs on the postman, uh, then uh, when I just received the callback, I can get the uh, callback on a uh, webhook.api. But how can I implement those things on my project? So can you tell me? So you would... Uh develop us like in whatever stack you choose you would develop a server which would which can receive calls on that particular endpoint and uh, based on the like in pydream also you can see if you can open pydream quickly in unwear yeah okay okay thank you in pydream also there's a trigger and uh, if there's a server here what we are saying is if the particular request path is slash v 1.0 slash this then do this. If the path is something else, then do this. So in a similar way, you would implement a server which can receive callbacks and based on the path that you get and based on various other things like the uh, headers that we've discussed, like HIP ID uh, and what facility it, it's communicating it to. Based on all these uh, uh, decisions that you would uh, further the process. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, hello. Uh, last question, please. Yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Yeah, like uh, uh, on fetch modes and on init, uh, I'm getting requests right. In that, uh, is there any field like to identify this is related to which patient? Uh, so again, I'm just like, getting the request ID. Again, like uh, the way we have discussed, let's uh, look at the uh, on fetch uh, headers and uh, okay. So you can see that here in the headers that uh, you would get the XHIP ID, which is the facility that has originally requested it. And in the body, there is RESP, if you can expand it. And uh, this is responding against this request ID. So this was the request ID that we used originally when we sent the fetch modes. So if you have the, if you can look at the fetch modes in Postman, uh, I think you've not had a fetch call after this, right? So you can uh, the, that would remain. Okay, so this is a this is being auto generated. So the request ID that we send here, it's responding against that request. So you would know based on inference and extrapolation that okay, this request had these particular uh, query attributes. So you know what like against which request it's corresponding to. 
so it's as a as a facility as an hip it's your responsibility to establish this chain somewhere and persist it in a database of sorts uh so that you can get back to those calls so you you would see uh something similar in the linking part uh, we have done it in a very crude way here on pipe dream uh, but it's your responsibility to uh, store that chain somewhere so that you can uh verify it with uh, a request that you have originally sent so the gateway will send you all the information that i'm responding to you based on for this request and i'm responding uh for this particular facility id and you would use you would collate all of that information to to get the information that you need thank you thank you uh, yeah, can i yeah. ask hey, one last question on the authentication of the okay. callback url so okay. is there any way to uh, protect Uh, the callback URL that we register from any outside world hitting it unnecessary. Like, is it authenticated or? Yeah, yeah. So as I've said uh, originally, uh, that uh, actually, yeah. Let's cover this very quickly. Uh, Ranveer, if you can copy that authorization uh, thing in here, headers in, inside the headers authorization. Just copy the yeah. value. All right. And open JWT dot IO. and uh, paste it in the encoded section yeah. uh remove back barrel yeah so you can see that uh, like if you sort of like look at the header payload and uh, you will if you scroll down you'll look at like you'll have signature in the verify signature part on the right hand side of it uh, scroll down please yeah so in here there is a certain attribute called n where this is a particular uh, key attribute and uh, there is a url called slash certs uh, the the url you can find it in the documentation um, i think it's uh, you can go to the building hip's uh, hip api section hello uh, hello uh, and in in here uh, they would like no in the documentation the apis oh i see i see i mean you you mean the public key right yes the cert and you would verify that the jwt has the same just a search for slash cert yeah just uh uh hit this api with the dev dot uh, you can hit it uh, on on the browser also try it out click on try it out yeah execute yeah you can just copy that url the curl url uh just the url just the url uh, just the url yeah yeah and you can paste it in the browser somewhere so this would give you a certain key material and and, and in in here if you see that there it would be an n value inside the key uh, material and uh, that n value would match with the n value that uh, uh, the the gateway has sent and then with that you can this is a security aspect and we have like sort of this is not the scope we are sort of dealing with uh, the the flow aspect of it but since for the completion sake this is how you would verify that uh, it, uh, the the gateway is who the gateway saying it is and you would also like have a uh, preliminary uh, authentication as if you get xhip id is is that a facility id that is registered with your hrp or is it or is it not so all these aspects you would take into account and uh, and ensure that uh, it, it uh, like you are not getting some other call from some other entity i hope that clears it all right thank you thank you, yeah, thank you. all right let's move on to the next section please hello 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 last question hello, hello. okay uh, okay so, uh, i i i've i've shared a test case uh, in this uh, chat so could you please check the uh, abhinesh sari uh, this is my name so basically uh, the, the third point uh, the third point uh, you know the system checks if it is a if it has an unused linking token this linking token is obtained using registration so basically uh, i have the i have mentioned so, the api below which we are using for the registration during registration the tokens that you are getting are not linking tokens they are for getting like they are for profile authentication 
if you're creating a card or if you're let's say getting a profile card the ab id card so you would use it for hid specific apis those are not linking tokens the so linking tokens uh, which one should i use over here for the, uh, we've just covered like in the auth modes there is uh, the process starts with slash auth slash in it and then it follows with slash auth slash confirm and once okay. the on confirm step is there the token that you get there that is the only linking token uh, for care context linking so uh, let's move on to care context linking okay that means yeah. uh, the uh, this point would be not be valid right the number 3 point yeah 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 hello admin last question uh, which api called by uh, profile share uh, vdmf uh, sorry Uh, which API called by profile share in ABDM app uh, API HR app? Uh, please uh, guide in Swagger. Which API called in profile share? Uh, so that is shared in the Postman. Uh, whenever you scan a QR code using your PHR app, uh, uh, PHR. Slash, yeah. The okay, can you show the you uh, endpoint on Postman? Uh, uh, I will till. Uh, share share profile uh, API in uh, PHR uh, on share. This, this you don't have to do anything, sir. Uh, the, as soon as you hit the QR code, gateway will automatically call this uh, URL. Okay. Okay. Thank you. This Thank URL you can see at the bottom of the page. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you are confirming that the uh, registration uh, access token which is from registration is not valid. You have to only do it through. Out mode. Out mode. Out right? That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, like, basically, this test uh, test case has to be removed, right? Uh, from this, uh, we are we downloaded this from this. Uh, M2, no, that uh, is for M one. For M one, you have to get profile thing. If you have any specific thing on whether it should be a part of the milestone or not, uh, let's take this on Dev Forum. You can like someone officially from NHA can comment on that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So moving on. So uh, we have covered the particular uh, flow wherein the auth flow, the different auth modes. Ranveer has demonstrated the the mobile OTP flow. Uh, there's also demonstration the the, the demographic auth uh, mode flow. So all these uh, auth flows will, as has been correctly pointed out, they are the only way for you to get a token, which it is called a linking access token, and it's used to link uh, particular set of health records. uh against the care context reference so what is a care context a care context is something that uh, as a logical whole defines either yeah. an encounter or a visit no, of a patient bataye nahi why good rahe ki hame nahi can you please uh, mute yourself thank you yeah uh so a care context is either something that is either an episode of care in case of an inpatient uh, visit uh, wherein they would be like multiple doctor checks and like uh, multiple prescriptions given they can all come under a part of care context or it can be uh, it can also be an encounter a, a specific visit uh, wherein a patient walks in as a consultation for a consultation and there is some uh, medical records that are generated at the end of that consultation be it uh, a prescription a consult record so uh, that is defined as a care context and then there are two modes for care context linking the first one being hip initiated linking wherein which directly follows uh, the, the the steps that we've discussed so there's a linking token and some sort of consultation happens on the interface wherein some data is generated on uh, of a, of a particular visit uh and uh, the hip would uh after the flow uh, hit the gateway saying that hey this particular patient was validated and they have an access token and uh, please link this with uh, this particular care context so only that metadata is linked uh the care context reference an id which says there is a particular health record against this patient against a particular ab id so that is hip initiated link and uh, we will Uh, see the flows of hip initiated linking before discovering before discussing the other as other uh, way of uh, doing the linking which is discovery initiated linking which would be called by the patient which would be initiated by the patient so let's look at the hip initiated linking part of this so once you get the token from the previous flow 
you would hit this particular API with links slash links slash links slash add context. And uh, obviously there are other aspects to the body like request added timestamp, but what is important here, uh, the meat of it is this link attribute, which uh, consists of the access token, the linking token that you've received from the previous flow. And then there is a patient and patient has other information as like the, the way you want to display the patient and like a unique identifier to identify this patient, uh, a unique identifier against which you want to link these particular care contexts. So care context is also an array of IDs, which uh, are either visit IDs or it's uh, our episode IDs based on how your facility uh, manages the uh, health information at their end. And once you hit that as the HRP, as the caller, uh, you would get an on, on ad context callback uh, with uh, an acknowledgement from ABDM saying, all right, these records are now linked. So that is a uh, short and sweet uh, HIP initiated linking because we've already established the auth flow. And uh, so now comes the other uh, way of linking records is discovery initiated linking, where let's say, a patient walks into a facility, they don't have an ABBA ID yet, but the facility is ABDM registered and they go through a consultation or like some certain like inpatient care and they have medical records in the system. And now they come back, they are registered and they want to sort of connect these records back uh, with ABDM saying that they want to identify that, yeah, I have these records in this particular way. That's when the patient would initiate the linking and it's done like as when we would demonstrate it, it, it's initiated by the patient. Uh, the flows for these. I think, uh, yeah. so, sorry to interrupt, uh, but I can only see this direct on the screen. Are you sharing any, uh, some other topic here? Like, is it the same here? Um, no, 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 I think uh, it's frozen for you. We are able to follow along uh, side for sure. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, the ABDM would be the caller in this sense, like the patient initiates a discover call. And as soon as they initiate the discover call, the ABDM would hit uh, in this particular, uh, uh, on this particular endpoint, slash p0.5, slash care context, slash discover and uh, the body would be in this particular format like there would be a transaction id that the apdm would generate and then the patient and with specific verified identifiers and unverified identifiers verified identifiers are something that apdm has verified like probably a mobile number that apdm knows is legit and un unverified identifiers could be uh, let's say a patient using a phr app to add their medical record uh, they can say, this is my medical record. This, this is the uh, medical ID uh, against which I have registered in this facility. So that can be used uh, in the discovery phase by the uh, HRP and its uh, corresponding facility to identify the patient in a better way. And then the basic demographic information, name, gender, and year of birth. And once this is hit, the HRP will receive this call. It'll at the process layer run an algorithm uh, to... Uh, check if any records exist. If it finds some, then in the on-discover call, it will send back those care contexts along with the transaction ID that has been received in the previous call. And obviously like rest of the stuff that we've discussed uh, in the, the whole callback way, they remain constant. Like there would be a request ID that ABDM would, uh, uh, ABDM would hit on the slash discover call and you would have to have a RESP attribute uh, against which your uh, replying the request and it, it, it needs to have a request ID uh, that was sent to you by the by ABDM originally and the headers also like remain consistent. Uh, moving further uh, you can find this uh, fuzzy match algorithm on this particular URL uh, in under key concepts and you can implement this is your responsibility to implement how you would implement uh, like uh, the the like what exact how granular it can get is, is dependent on you, but on a base level, uh, this is the bare minimum that is recommended by, uh, by uh, ABDM for you to uh, implement. So moving forward, uh, then once, the, once we send uh, uh, the care context on, on Discover, 
then ABDM calls the starts the init process of linking, where it would send the transaction ID again, and it would send the patient ID and care context, and uh, uh, that we are we are initiating this process. Then HRP would respond with on init with transaction ID, and a random uh, nonce number of sorts that we are calling it a reference number here. It could be a randomly generated uh, UID. Uh, it's a it's 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 a, it's a reference number inside this object called link. So this is used for uh, correlation and validation that uh, yes this these can be linked. So that's available in the sequence diagram here. I've added a sequence diagram to make things clear. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide, all right. So the link slash link in it is something that we have seen. The gateway response and then the link in it request has started, and the HI, the HRP, HIP slash HIP would uh, respond with a link reference number. And once it responds with link slash on in it, then the HIP system would send an out of band token or an OTP uh, to the patient on like they would have the mobile number on that particular system and it would send the OTP to them. And when the user enters the OTP on a PHR app, the gateway will send back the confirm call uh, slash link slash link slash confirm with the link reference number that was originally shared by the repository, by the HRP to identify that, uh, yeah, the HRP call. And also the token that the patient has uh, received uh, the user, the PHR user has received to validate, yes, this is the correct person, intended person of these uh, health records. Once in combination, in confluence, we can verify that that is indeed the user. And we would respond with on confirm on, yes, this indeed, like we acknowledge that uh, these records have been, have now been linked. And then the gateway would uh, uh, add those like meta records on it in the particular that so that completes the discovery initiated linking flow and uh, now we like as we've discussed the, the slash confirm and slash on confirm so let's move on to the demonstration of this entire process uh, and before moving on to the questions uh, right so um, for the demonstration um, like we mentioned um, previously uh, for this particular flow there is a timeout uh, element to it so when when uh, when when the patient hits the discover call from the phr app uh, or the gateway hits the discover call the uh, facility has to respond with the on discover within a certain uh, very short period of time i think it's 2 or 3 seconds which isn't humanly possible to do it on postman um, this is one of the main reasons we've done, uh, we've implemented the flow on pipe tree because we can automate that process. And, uh, based on the, uh, based as soon as the API call is received, we've set it up so that it responds with the on discover call and the flow can, uh, the, we can demonstrate the flow. So, um, before I share my phone screen, uh, I will just really quickly show you the pi implementation of pipe tree, just so that everyone has an idea on, um, on uh, what we've exactly done. Um, so if uh, so, uh, in PyBream, the basic concept is that uh, there is a trigger that is received, uh, and and once the trigger is received, uh, we have so we have this uh, we have this code in this main file that uh, that processes the information received on that trigger. Now that trigger is an API call. So based on the information we're receiving, like so now if you can see, we have a certain like cascading if condition. So if if the if if the API is this API, we do this. If the API is this API, we do this. So we covered the share part of it. Now, if I go uh, to the next uh, condition, we can see that if it matches the API call to the discover call, and if it if it is indeed the discover call, it uh, it it does the necessary steps to respond with the on discover call. So um, as uh, as I had discussed, the body of the discover call includes uh, includes the ancillary information like the request ID and the timestamp that stays common uh, for all APIs. And we have to respond with the transaction ID, which in this case is the correlation ID that uh, tells the gateway that uh, this on discover call is for this particular discover call. And then um, after that, uh, we respond with the patient. So information. You can also quickly uh, give reference to what request body is. Request body is something that uh, we have received on. Uh, yes. Yeah. On, yeah. on this particular call. 
right. on so the they... discover call we receive something on the slash uh, can you scroll down the yeah slash v0.5 slash care context slash discover we we receive a certain body and that has uh, certain attributes so we pick transaction id from that request body and pass it back in this body as ranveer has mentioned like it's a correlation id that uh, sets the chain uh, together right and so transaction id we send a date would that work no this is a, this is how you have to follow the flow so there is there is a certain there are certain rules of engagement on how you have to move further these have been established by the abdm uh, team that uh, you know we will send you a transaction id on discover and on discover you have to send that transaction id back so that we can establish the chain okay. we, we have so to follow the, those. okay yeah okay. Yeah. Thank you. yeah thank you right so uh uh, yeah, like as I said, the transaction ID is the correlation ID over here. So that has to match the transaction ID that we receive in the discover call. Um, because the gateway has to logically link the a particular discover to an on discover. Otherwise, uh, it won't be able to do that. So um, after that, we have the patient attribute where we have to enter uh, the reference number for the patient. Uh, this is um, this is an internal uh, un unique identifier of the patient. Internal as in it, it is internal to your software. Uh, ABDM does not uh, lay any kind of specifications on on what kind of ID it has to be, as long as it's resolvable within your own uh, in your own system to a particular patient, it's okay. So it can be anything. Um, I mean, for simplicity, I've I've just entered a uh, PUID slash um, like a, a certain number of digits thing, but it can be anything. And then you have to enter the display, which is um, logically the name of the patient, and then it says the information on the care context. Um, now, uh, care context, uh, like as mentioned in this comment over here, and as I mentioned when he was going through the, uh, the details about the API, uh, this would, this would be, uh, this would be the information that your, uh, that your fuzzy match algorithm outputs, your fuzzy match algorithm would match a patient to a list of care contacts, right? Like it would, it would match a particular patient to a particular, a particular patient in your system, which who would have uh, certain consultations or visits associated with it. And this would be returned from that algorithm. Now, obviously we haven't implemented the app because this is a very light um, uh, kind of a, a simulation of an HRP. We don't have a, uh, we don't have a database over here to run that fuzzy match algorithm. We've hard coded a care, particular care context, but this it's very important to understand that this care context is what is returned by your algorithm. Um, so once you have that information, uh, which is uh, you, sh you should, uh, have a reference number for every care context, which again is an internal identifier. There are no specifications for this. This could be a, 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 a very simple integer based ID. It could be a CU ID, anything that is resolvable within your own system. Again, I've come up with a um, very random heuristic right now and call it visit slash uh, uh, four times nine and eight, but it can be anything. And the display it can be anything that makes sense to a human. So I like, uh, I've just put test consultation on 18 November right now, but this this has to be human readable. And once you once you have uh, once you have that object, you you'll have one object per care context. So obviously there can be multiple visits or uh, consultations associated with a particular patient, and you can enter all of them within an array. So this would this could this could this array of care context could have multiple objects within it, and you would send that in the care context attribute in the body. And uh, the matched by uh, attribute, uh, just to give a bit of background. Uh, so you ha like if you look at the um, fuzzy match algorithm, uh, the the diagram that we had shown. If you look at it in detail, yeah, the first step involves matching the verified identifiers. The verified identifiers for a patient can either be the mobile or it can be the ABHA ID or the ABHA address. So you have to specify, and and if any of them match, uh, you can. Um, you, you can go ahead with the rest of the algorithm. So in this matched by field, you have to specifically say what, what, uh, what, which verified identifier was used to match the was match the patient. So if it, if it was the it was the it was a mobile number that you used to identify the patient, then you have to send mobile. If it was a health ID, you have to return health underscore ID. So um, that will depend. And then obviously the response body contains the request ID that you re uh, received in the uh, discover body. The original and, request uh, body. The original request body, correct. 
and uh, once you've uh, you've uh, collated this information you will send it as the body on the on discover call and um, and it will be uh, and the and the discovery initiated flow will move forward uh, the this is gw for- api config uh, let's be pretty sure that's it's the headers that uh, would establish uh, yeah over here the yeah, headers the authorization the api config yeah it's the headers with the authorization the xcm id exactly the same as what i showed you in postman um, there is no difference to that right uh, and uh, this is followed by the init call so once again we've uh, checked if the api that is received is an init api then uh, it first generates a link reference number which is uh, which is a uuid it's a randomly generated uuid and um, this uh, the purpose of this reference number is specifically to link an otp to a particular transaction so because uh, if as a as in if you recall from what i said um, the otp is sent out of band so it is sent directly from you to the uh, to the user there is no uh, a gateway in between this particular um, sending of the otp so you have to store in your database that this particular otp this six digit or how many ever digit otp you've generated is corresponding to this reference number so when it is sent back to you you can validate it so that is the way that you have to uh, validate that the otp entered by the uh, patient is correct so that is the reference number that's generated um and once again you have to uh, you have to send the transaction id in the link object you'll send the reference number the authentication type uh, is going to be direct uh for this particular uh, api flow and because we the, are sending an out of band otp directly to the patient to, right yeah correct and uh in the meta uh, object you have the communication medium which is mobile because it's uh, you're sending it to the mobile number of the patient and um and you you can set the expiry um that is dependent on how you want to do it you can but it obviously like, goes without saying it has to be future date and uh, once again you have the request in the response object you have the request id and once you gen- you um, you collate this body you will send it in the on init call back to the gateway and uh, the uh, and but then after this you have to send the otp so we have uh, kind of uh, we have utilized a particular sms gateway we have integrated with a different application to send that otp for the purposes of the demonstration but this has to uh, if you it's it's very important to understand that when you hit this on in it call the otp does not go that is something you have to send out of band to the patient so that is something that you have to take care of and that we've done over here this this particular api i'm not going to go into how this api is working because it's uh, uh, you will be implementing it differently depending on your software but what it, this is doing is it's sending an otp directly to uh, a, a mobile patient number that we've defined which in for the purpose of this demonstration is my mobile number and um once that is done uh, uh once once that is done you have to uh, we are uh, using a temporary data store to store that otp against the reference number so that we can verify it uh, we can verify it in the uh, w- w- when the patient sends it back in the confirm call so this is a temporary data store i'll 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 show it to you when when we're um, when we're uh, doing the uh, dem- when 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 i show you the demonstration of the entire thing and uh, the, after that comes the confirm api uh which is uh which is hit when the patient enters the otp on the phr app and uh essentially and then what the patient yeah. enters the otp on the phr app and what the gateway will do is it'll take the otp and it'll also uh, uh, the gateway has a data store of its own wherein it will send the link reference number that we have previously sent in the previous step together it'll send us both the link ref number and the otp and then it is our responsibility to sort of uh, establish uh, uh, equality with the otp that we were storing originally we have sent an otp originally and is this the same as the otp that the gateway is sending right and uh, then we move forward with the uh, the on confirm call that that finishes the the, the flow for this right so i'm going to show my mobile screen and then um, yeah just really quickly show it working
All right. So, um, so in order to initiate the, um, the, uh, the discover call, I'm going to click on link my health records and I'm going to search for, um, the facility, which I think was called ABDM workshop. Uh, yeah, ABDM workshop facility. So we can see it's founded. And, uh, when I hit this, the discover call should be here and we can see that there is a, what will happen is a list of consultations that have been found by the HIP will be returned. So over here, as you saw in the code, there was one uh, consultation with this particular reference number, four times nine and eight, and it says test consultation on 18 November. So I'm going to click on link selected. This is going to hit the init API and um, uh, the OTP is going to be sent to my mobile. So I'm just waiting for that. Yeah, I've got the OTP. And we'll run with this is uh, this is the ABA app, is it? Yeah, this is the ABA PHR app, correct. So we will be using the ABA app to do all this stuff, not yeah. developing our own. Uh, I mean, uh, I think you can develop your own PHR app, uh, but if you are focusing on M2, uh, the M2 in part of the integration, and right. uh, yeah, then you will be using this app, correct? Perfect, thank you. So the OTP is 776-361. So this has been sent by uh, the facility directly, not by the gateway. And when I click on confirm, we can see it says the record has been linked and we can verify this. So if I go to my um, linked facilities, we can see ABDM workshop facility with visit uh, this test consultation on 18 November, right? So that kind of concludes uh, the discovery initiated linking. Uh, I'm going to switch back to my... Could, you, could um, you please show the previous one one second, please? Can I please show the... Sorry? Just this last bit. Uh, the This? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, this is just the verification that it was, in fact, linked. So, if you go to the linked facility tab on the app, you will find a list of facilities with which care contacts have been linked for this particular patient. So, we can see ABDM workshop facility is a facility name. And when I click on this, when I expand it, we'll be able to see a list of the consultations within that facility that have been linked for this patient. So right now, because we've only linked one, we can see the details over here. So, so we see the two two here, NDM, Dr. Five test, and this one. So this, this patient has visited two facilities. So That's far. correct. That's okay. correct. Perfect. That's okay. correct. Yes. And, so again, uh, and yeah. the dates of these visits will only show up if you have actually put in the dates in this particular uh, uh, the free text column or whatever that correct. is. Right? Correct. correct. Only correct. only the meta information is with the gateway, not, not even the dates. It's just yeah. the patient. That's a very important part. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You're you're correct. It's because I put it in the display part that the test consultation on 18 November is being displayed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. So if I was to query saying, can you give me a range of records from this day to this day, that may not work. Oh, uh, no. So that is, that is a, so that we'll cover in the data transfer okay. part. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that's a different I, flow. The, 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 the date uh, range of it has to be uh, authenticated by an HIP. The gateway doesn't know what are the records from a particular date range to a particular date range. Oh, All it has is that there is a record that is linked and then it is linked against this patient ID under this facility. That's all the gateway knows. Now, when a consent is started, uh, then the gateway will send a consent. Hey, this is the requesting date range. Then the facility who is doing the push, we will see that shortly. But that facility would say, okay, these are the records. These are the only records in this particular date range and the facility would validate and then send the records in the form of the data uh, forward that that we'll look at but the gateway right. doesn't know anything about anything except for the the meta information here. And okay. is there any is there any limit on the number of records it will return let's say it has 100 records against this patient this facility so is there any limit 10 it will return 10 there is no limit as such it would return all the like when you send sort of send a discover call if the facility chooses to send all the records you would get all the records and uh, it's yeah. prerogative all the unlinked records. So if, records, records, yeah. so if yeah, so like for example, now if I try to if I retry the discovery initiated flow with uh, this with the ABDM workshop facility, it it will not return anything because the 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 visit ID with this particular reference number is already been linked. So it'll just say all records have been linked. 
so how does so the facility uh, the hospital provider also knows that it has been linked to this pm yeah. yes you have to uh, like it's recommended that you maintain that as well so if uh, i am connected to n number of phr apps then it's going to be as a hospital side i have to maintain that okay this patient has received from this phr app versus uh, that phr app so this comes back to the original question uh, the one facility it's recommended is is handled by one uh, one hrp so the hrp will sort of take care of there's like one to many relationship between the hrp and the facility but uh, you would have a single hrp like your facility would not be talking to multiple hrps but even if it is talking to multiple hrps uh, only one hrp would be uh, de facto the man in the middle uh, okay. sort of an entity so so if you are saying so if i am connected to this abha app then then uh, then it is already linked with one phr then the no, second no. phr for the same patient will not work right no so i think uh, like the confusion over here is that what the abha app is just a facilitator the records are not getting linked with the app they're getting linked with the abdm gateway so it's whether the face yeah, uh, yeah this the is the interface yeah. yeah so whether you whether you link it with this app or you use a different app they will be they are getting linked with the cent, the central abdm gateway so uh you, like you would ask do you have to maintain records of which app it's linked with no not at all you just have to maintain a record that this is already linked okay. because they're all linked with the gateway okay understood So yeah. just just last bit there, Ranveer. Yeah. So as a technology service provider, we will create the HRP module or maybe say information exchange internally for all the HRPs that will be using our product, right? Mm -hmm. And this HRP is then integrated with ABDM gateway to right. do the exchange, right? Right. <clears throat> is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just I have one question. uh regarding like uh, how we get the list of hrps like uh, facilities i mean using with uh, multiple hrps hrps like uh, I, i am the provider of one hrp but uh, if i have to like uh, fetch sure. another hrp facilities then is it possible to yeah going back to the first principles uh, there's only one hrp if you have one client id and one client secret that is communicated Uh, to you by the nsa team that is one hrp and that hrp can have multiple facilities linked under it and as discussed initially you have the get services uh, api call which you can hit to get all the facilities registered under this hrp right mm -hmm. but uh, what what happened with uh, like uh, that facility not register under that hrp if it's not registered on the under the hrp the hrp would not be communicating the data as simple as that for that facility uh, is there any way to communicate with another hrp uh you have to link your facility with that particular hrp to link that the way to do that is again the recording will be shared of course is to sort of first establish the bridge and then from that bridge you would be registering a facility under that bridge and once that facility is registered then your hrp is uh, linked uh, it links the abdm components with your facility facilitating the communication for all the phases that you see between m2 and m3 so okay hello sai yes oh, question uh, may i continue yes please yeah so the the question is in a patient initiated uh, discovery link process for a for a single discover can there be multiple link in it initiations that can happen though in the, in the you know the phr app that we now see that is not possible from a ui screen i'm asking in terms of implementing the workflows on the hip side so right. for a discover can be can it be followed by multiple uh, link in it so there is a single link in it that link can have multiple care context to it if you look at the body uh, no, no that can... that i got you know that yeah. that i got i'm just yeah. saying uh, in in my uh, uh, state machine or uh, what workflow for yeah. a one for one discover only one link in it i don't that's to... correct yes, okay, yes that's that's correct, correct. Thank, yeah. you. thank you yeah thank you it's oh. all identified by the transaction id that is sort of yeah. spread together yeah that's true but i was yeah. just I wanted to check that the same transaction id be, uh, uh, cannot be received in another link in it that follows later that is that is that flow we don't have to support yeah 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 that you don't have to support yes so, uh, okay. thank you yeah. hello 
Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, Mehul from Tinder Health. Uh, I have a question I'm... regarding uh, uh, if I want I want to link uh, some prescription or some lab reports, then how how I can link that and how how it will be so showing here. So we will be shortly discussing about how uh, you uh, you can prepare the data and identify it as a part of care context. But the fact is that uh, key the you would say something is a care context as discussed either after an encounter, which is to say there's a visit or there's an episode of care and whatever health records generated are identified as a part of that care context. And now how exactly you would sort of prepare the data and transfer the data uh, with encryption, decryption, uh, we will see the entire flow shortly. But for now, just know that there is like when in the in case of HIP initiated linking, uh, as soon as you need to identify a logical point where the consultation is done, uh, logically finished, and there you would need to generate a care context reference ID for that particular visit. And internally, you would also store what sort of artifacts uh, are there for that particular, whether it's a consult record, it's a prescription record, that is something that the uh, HIP would uh, be responsible for. Uh, wherein this care context reference has all these artifacts. How to send them as data when, let's say, uh, the uh, the care context reference that Ranveer has uh, here for ABDM workshop facility has visit hyphen like five nines. If you pull records, then it is on the HIP that the, uh, a particular flow will happen, which we will cover. There, uh, it's HIP's responsibility to identify what records are against this particular care context to prepare them accordingly uh, in the file format, to encrypt them and then send them. We will look at that flow um, once we are there. One, one quick question. Uh, in terms of the addresses, see, we were talking about uh, HIPs and HRPs, but the one uh, clarity I need is, see, for example, here, my linked facilities, you have already chosen one ABA address, right? It is mm -hmm. related to that particular ABA address. Is my understanding yeah. correct? When, when we are, we are logging yes. in. Yes. So what is that, uh, uh, the linkage between the ABA address and these? See, for example, if I want to move this facility, let's say, for example, I wrongly tagged or if I merge because I, as an individual, can have multiple ABA addresses, right? Yeah, correct. So how that uh, combination, because see, from a user experience perspective, if I have yeah. created four ABA addresses between yeah. my so and Interestingly, this is a question that we had originally posted in the forum also. Right now, once a particular care context is linked, there is no way to remove it from the, the way the, once the linkage happens. So uh, extra sense of caution has to be taken when you're doing it in production. But in SPX, uh, there, is, there is, as far as I remember and I know at this particular point, there is no way to remove the, uh, the, the care context once it is linked. Because the, um, your point, your point stands. No, your point yes. stands that from a UX perspective, it's better to like if there has to be a particular way, and probably you can add that to the dev forum, and uh, we 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 can also back you up there. Sure, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Renvi, just to take the previous point, yeah, uh, um, health ID is going to be unique, whereas we'll have a multiple mm -hmm. health addresses. Mm -hmm. Right, each uh, HRP will create their own health ID when there is nothing for that patient. If there is a health ID already exist, then each HR will create the health addresses so that the so, record, internal record can be linked up to that health address. Is that correct? So again, this is the way that this works, particularly what you said initially is uh, spot on, that there is a, a single health number and under that there can be multiple health addresses, Address. ABA addresses they are called. Right. Uh, when you log in, then you would have to select what app against what app address you're uh, logging in. If you, as a part of the patient validation flow, either via share or like verbally you're sharing, you share a particular AVA address, then it would be linked against that address. So that right. it is given as a sort of convenience sake for mm -hmm. you to have your mental health records in, in, in some part, under some particular ID, your like normal uh, records, general health records under some ID. That's the way it would work. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, let's uh, move on. L one last question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. One one facility can that be registered under multiple HRP or 
uh, like how will a feasibility move from one HRP to another if they want to move it? So uh, add update services may you can there is a there is a uh, active status uh, attribute where you can disable it and then you can register the same facility for you know, under a different HRP. But what will happen on this linked facilities? Will it show show up in the previous HRP? They or? Will, yeah, they will show up. Yes. yes. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Hello. One. Yeah. Now, my question is: uh, Once I receive on discover card, okay, uh, do I need to send any acknowledgement to Gateway, or else I will call to on discover? So, discover call is something that uh, the Gateway sends you, correct? And yeah. then the on discover yeah. call is something that you send. So that itself is is an acknowledgement with the the care context records that you found. In your system, no, no. Actually, what happened? No, we are uh, receiving the discover call, and we are trying to uh, call the on discover. We are getting the response on uh, no other is. Yeah, your token might have been uh, expired. You have to send an authorization. I am using the uh, that uh, on discover token. Sorry, discover token. No, discover may you don't get any token. The token can only be received by the sessions URL. And in the session URL, whatever access token you get, that you have to include as a part of the authorization header uh, as a bearer token. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ranveer. Let's move on to the next section. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I uh, didn't cover the uh, patient in, uh, discover uh, HIV initiated linking, so I can't really go through. Okay. Um, yeah. Please that, go so. Yeah. Let me just share my laptop screen instead. Right, so um, so that was the discovery initiated linking. Uh, for the uh, for the HIP initiated linking, as uh, uh, as if you recall, once I was going through the uh, the theory behind it, there is just one uh, API sequence, which is the add care context, um, which is the add care context uh, API, uh, and uh, and and its callback, which is on add care, on add context. Uh, so this is where we will we, where we use the linking token that we get after validation. Um, so if I uh, go back to the to the validation uh, token that we received, sorry, give me one second. Sorry, does to... the does the linking token have a TTL or is it uh, a perennial? Uh, it uh, has uh, it has a, a, an yeah. expiry, but uh, it's uh, it's significantly higher than the normal sessions token. Like it's more than a day, so you can use it. Okay. But the the direct auth mode is 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 perennial until you use it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, so first thing, I'll also just hit the fetch auth token API so that we have a valid uh, authorization token here. And over here, I'll, uh, in the add context, the body uh, has uh, obviously the request ID timestamp, but in the link um, in the link attribute, it has the access token, which I will paste um, the linking token. And then in the patient uh, patient attribute, we have an object which will have the reference number. Again, I'm using uh, the same reference number. Um, and uh, display is my name. Care context will be an array. Uh, just as I mentioned before, if you have multiple care contacts, they'll have uh, multiple objects. And each object object has a reference number and a display. Um, just uh, just a quick note, I'm using a visit slash a GUID. I'm using a template thing just to differentiate it from the discovery initiated linking thing. So it's, uh, it's gonna just be a visit slash a really long random ID and display is consultation on some random past date. Um, again, the way Postman is going to generate this date is going to be, I think it's an ISO timestamp or something. So um, just, uh, just, just, just keep in mind that these are, uh, these are custom. You can do whatever you want to these two, as long as they may, uh, the display should make sense, uh, should be human readable and the reference number should resolve within your own system. So, um, so I'm going to hit this API. I get a 202 accepted and, uh, and if I go back to here, we get a callback where we have a success acknowledgement. Uh, it's a status success. And uh, if I go back to the PHR app, uh, we uh, my I'll have to share my phone screen. Let me do it really quickly just for completion's sake. Um,
yeah, we can see that uh, that uh, now with ABDM workshop facility, there are two uh, two uh, consultations that are linked. One is the visit <coughs> visit um, five times nine, which uh, was a discovery initiated one, and then there's this visit with this complex UUID and consultation on uh, on Saturday, October twenty ninth. Uh, uh, whatever 2022 with the timestamp. So we can see that both methods of linking have worked. And uh, I think that completes the, um, that completes the care context linking part of it. And I think we can move forward. Let me share my uh, laptop screen again. Right. So, um, Sai, I think we can move forward to the next section. Right. So now the care context has been linked. We've started with, uh, if we quickly, if you can just press escape so that we can see the history of the slides that we have walked past through. So there is the, we started with the patient validation and then uh, the foundational prerequisites and then the patient validation. And we've looked at the care context linking and both flavors of care context linking, HIP initiated and uh, discovery uh, patient initiated. So now the uh, aspect of, uh, we move on to the aspect of data transfer. So yeah, a patient has a linked care context. Now somebody wants to know what is behind that care context. So uh, there is a particular flow that happens. In essence, uh, there would be uh, we are going to look at this from the perspective of HIP because M2. Uh, so there is a there would be a, a HIU which would be initiating a consent flow, uh, the process which we would uh, look at shortly. And once that happens, uh, the gateway will receive the requests and all that. So the first flow that the first call that the uh, uh, HIP would receive from the ABDM. Uh, is uh, slash v0.5 slash consent slash HIP slash notify. So again, there are other parts to the body, of course, but what you essentially get is a notification with the status and consent ID and the consent detail, which will have information on what the consent is all about. Like what is the uh, date range, what's the ID and all the related ancillary details. And once you do get that call, you would hit back with on notify and say, uh, and sort of send the acknowledgement back to the gateway saying that, yes, you have, you acknowledge this consent. Uh, if you're not able to, for some reason, then you would uh, send the appropriate error code for that, for those you can refer to the documentation. But once you do send the acknowledgement, uh, the next part uh, of the flow starts wherein the ABDM would then, because you have sent it the acknowledgement that yeah, you will acknowledge the consent, uh, ABDM would send you uh, a request uh, for the uh, uh, required health information. In here, it would send you the transaction ID and the HI request, which has the consent artifact ID against which it is trying to request the data. It will also give you date range. Somebody was asking uh, previously, on uh, like between what date range it is here that uh, the HIP would get uh, the, the, the date range between which uh, it has to respond with uh, the health records uh, that fall in, uh, in that particular range. I would also get a data push URL. This is the URL that uh, again is an out of band thing where uh, the HIP would send the data to in an encrypted format, of course. And when we say encrypted format, it would use the key material uh, that is sent in this HI request object in its encryption process. And how that happens also, we will look in uh, detail. And once this step happens, uh, there is the on request call uh, where which HRP would uh, again, respond back to the gateway with an acknowledgement saying that, uh, hey, I have done the uh, I've your request is received and uh, I am going to uh, HRP uh, would say I'm going to sort of send that data to the particular data push URL. That is the acknowledgement. Moving further, uh, something wrong? Um, just say, uh, I think my um, 
screen. Floating. Yeah, that's all that. Yeah. Yeah. Is it visible again? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Is it visible to everybody else? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So as you can see, the gateway would send the HIV request as discussed, and uh, the notification is sent to the, uh, the HRP to the HIP, whether that could be a different service or it's a part of your same HIP system, that uh, depends on your implementation. And once that request is received, we send the on request uh, back. And then the HIP would prepare the data. So please sit with this abstraction. We will, we will uh, discuss what preparation essentially entails. And once the data is prepared, uh, which is like has to do one with uh, putting it in a particular format that the ABDM ecosystem understands and then encrypting it. So both of these steps entail prepare, preparation of the data. And once that data is prepared, then whatever the data push URL is that we've received, uh, we will send the data to that particular data push URL. And here Gateway is not involved. And once that happens, the HRP would, or the HIP would hit the uh, slash health information slash notify call, notifying the gateway of either a successful or an unsuccessful transfer. So that in its entirety covers the flow on uh, the data request and transfer aspect of it. Before looking at the demonstration of this flow, uh, let's move further, move uh, further down. I think it will cover the notify the, the data push URL. This is like the body structure where there's a particular page number and uh, it would be a zero indexed uh, number starts with zero. Page count would indicate the total number of pages. That is transaction ID and then entries where content is an, an encrypted format of the, uh, the actual data and uh, the checksum, the care context reference and the key material with which uh, the receiving uh, and uh, which is generally, uh, which is an HIU, uh, which it would use this key material to decrypt, uh, uh, decrypt the uh, received uh, encrypted uh, form of the data. Uh, let's move down. And uh, this also is something that we've just discussed where once either a successful transfer on the HIP part is communicated or an unsuccessful transfer is communicated to the gateway uh, with the uh, shown uh, body, uh, which we will see in detail when uh, we go for the dem demonstration of this particular flow. So that in general is how the data transfer part of it would work on uh, the HIP end. Before moving on to the demonstration, uh, let's discuss the, the FIRE aspect of it. So, so FIRE stands for Fast Health Interoperability Records. And uh, this is essentially a format that uh, uh, ABDM it has chosen to use so that there is a standard in terms of communication across the different uh, stakeholders that involve themselves in the system. And uh, uh, along with uh, uh, NCRES, uh, ABDM has defined a certain set of uh, artifacts. In FIRE, you would find different uh, terminology. So it's important for you to understand what these different terms entail. So you would be hearing artifact. An artifact is generally anything. Artifact in general is, is an entity, a, a logical entity. It could be a, a simple JSON structure or it could be a, a server instance or a digital artifact, whatever. But general umbrella term in fire, it is used to describe fire data. Uh, but in general, it's used to describe the entire bundles. So it, it could be an OP consult artifact or like uh, uh, a prescription artifact. And there is something called a resource. And these are like discrete units of uh, data, uh, like atomic units, which can be uh, transferred either independently or as a part of, of a bundle. Now what's a bundle? A bundle is simply a bundle of different resources, as simple as that. I mean, there is more nuance to this, of course, which uh, uh, Ranveer will cover in detail, but uh, that's what a bundle is simply. And composition, there's something called a composition. A composition is also a resource, which is uh, 
for for the most part like uh, this is the norm this is the common place you would find that the first resource in any bundle is a composition the first resource in any bundle is a composition resource which sort of uh, defines the compositional structure of that bundle right and then the composition itself would contain references to other resources for example let's say there could be a uh, a, a, a consult op consult composition inside the op consult composition there would be a subject who would be the patient and uh, that would be reference to a particular resource it would just be the metadata and the bundle has a whole will contain the uh, the actual patient resource so this we will see uh, in play shortly but uh, and 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 run we will cover this in detail you can scroll down yeah so as i was telling you nrcs nrcs has like a, a set list of artifacts for the abdm system like these are the seven artifacts that you will find diagnostic report discharge summary and op consult prescription and wellness and I, as i was just saying each artifact is 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 a bundle with a particular composition resource at the very top uh, defining the structure of the bundle in a uh, whole you can scroll down all right so again like how you would generate a particular fire bundle uh, we suggest this particular format for example which hi type are you generating right like if you're generating a prescription bundle i'm pretty sure your facilities they already store data in some format whether it be prescription whether it be consultation or other vital metrics data that your facility has so uh, think of this as an abstraction if you have to uh, generate a prescription you would have a certain function called get prescription bundle and there would be an identifier this could be a visit identifier and or an episode of care identifier some some sort of an identifier which would identify a uh, prescription data for that particular uh, whatever that particular id represents and uh, moving further down and like what we would cover here is is how the bundles work and like how like what a composition is what a bundle is and uh, how the work i think uh, ranveer uh, you take over from here right. um sorry Kish, sorry, uh, this is a question so do we yeah. have a profile that you are using or what kind of profile will we be following uh profile in 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 the sense the fire profile the fire profile does abdm have a profile yeah profile? yeah yeah the nrcs defines a fire profile and it's available and that's something that run you will cover uh let's hold the phone questions for like 5 minutes until this is done sure thank you yeah thank you yeah so um <clears throat> so as i was saying um uh the, there are different uh, there are different uh, kinds of resources in fire so the 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 fundamental or like Uh, what a bundle is 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 as the name suggests a bundle of resources um so that this is what we can see over here it is an example of a bundle resource um specifically uh for an op consult record so i'm just going to take you through the structure um now the the bundle initially it'll, it'll have some metadata which is uh, which is um which is kind of common to all resources there there is a version id last updated there's time stamp and uh, and each bundle has a unique id now this id again has to be uh, resolvable within your system uh, so abdm does not set any requirements for this id this has to be uh, unique to your system but it has to be present over here then the the meat of the bundle is in the entry object which is an array now this entry array has multiple resources within it the first one uh, and we're talking specifically in the abdm concept uh, co context has to be the composition resource the composition resource sets the structure for this particular bundle so this bundle is an op consult bundle and that is defined in the composition resource so we can see um sorry we can see over here the first entry we can see the full you are the resource type is composition the composition itself has a unique id which is a cuid hyphen oc oc standing for op consult again that is this is a heuristic you can define completely on your own there is no set standard for this um but uh, the id has to be there uh then moving forward the composition has uh, as we can see over here the type encoding specifies that it's a clinical consultation report 
and then the composition itself has references to other resources like it has a subject attribute which will refer to a patient so it will say it will say patient slash the id of the patient resource then uh, and and then the, it'll it'll um, it'll refer to the encounter episode uh, so it'll, it'll this is an op concept for a particular encounter so it's referring to another resource an encounter resource so it's encounter slash the id of the encounter resource so and all of these references have to be resolvable within this bundle so essentially what that means is that if i'm referring to this patient slash this cl9 whatever this id is this id with this 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 resource with this id has to be present in this very entry there because uh, the bundle has to be self resolved everything that the composition is referring to has to be present over here so like we can see if i go all the way down the next entry in this array is the patient resource of with that particular id so that that is the entire structure of a bundle with the composition at its helm and followed by all of the other resources that the composition is referring so that is um the general structure of a bundle uh moving and, forward yeah. yeah as we move forward as uh, we see here that get op consultation like for different bundles you would create different functions uh we would recommend that you break down each bundle function into specific resource uh, functions so as ranveer was saying that there are different resources that are generated by a bundle so for that for each of those resources we suggest that you write a function specifically for that identifier so that uh, uh, so the get the patient resource practitioner resource are general resources that can be used in other bundles also so that you can make use of these functions in creating other bundles and as you can see the in the the, the middle of this the get composition for op concept you would be creating a, a, a composition resource which would define the entire bundle itself Uh, and you would club them all these together, all of these together, to generate the final OP consultation bundle. So it really is a composition uh, in play. Right. Yeah. Right. So, like, like as I said, the individual functions over here would generate the resources. You'd go, you, you'd combine all of them into the entries array of the bundle, with the composition being on top, and that would essentially be your entire bundle. So if we, if you follow. this modular approach it just it makes things easier uh, especially when you have a, a complicated software and you're not doing it just for an op consult you have all the other hi type multiple patients uh, a modular approach would really um, we have found it it has made the process uh, much easier so yeah and, um, and so moving forward uh, uh, i think this page the the actual web page is not rendering let me Just reload yeah. the page. Yeah. So, um, so someone was asking about the profile that uh, we are following, right? So, uh, so the profile we are uh, we are using for all the HI types is the ones that have been specified by NRC ES. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you an example. The 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 documentation for the OP consult record, since that is the one we are discussing. Um, so over here we can um uh, we can we can see uh the the entire structure that has been defined for an op consult record within the apdm system now um uh the the way to kind of uh, read uh, and and yeah someone was asking about the profile the official url for the profile is here which has to be present in the metadata of the bundle you're sending so um this that's a fire requirement and uh if we uh, look at the text summary really quick we can see that Uh, this op consult they are already telling us that it refers to these other resources the patient encounter practitioner practitioner role uh, now uh, you also have to keep in mind that all of these are not required um uh, there are certain resources that are required others are not we'll just look at the uh, we'll just look at the structure and uh, and and see which ones are but you have to uh, decide on a uh based on your software and based on your uh, your uh, hims or telemedicine or whatever software you have what resources are relevant to you and based on that you have to generate um your own uh, op consult and, and 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 things like that so this is dependent on your system but if you come back to the documentation um each uh, this is so the documentation is for the composition resource of the op consult because that is what defines the entire uh, in th that that's what defines the data so within the composition resource you have a uh, different at, you have different uh, components so you have the type which in turn has the code 
the coding um, and the system, the code and the display. Uh, so generally, the coding that is followed and is recommended uh, that we followed is the SNOMED, uh, the SNOMED, uh, the SNOMED SCT uh, codes and ABDM. The N the NRCS documentation have specified the codes as well. So it says over here, if you can see, the code is a fixed value three seven one five three zero 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 four. This is uh, this corresponds to a clinical consultation report in SNOMED CT. So they've made the process easier. You don't have to go and look up which SNOMED code you should put in. Uh, for most things which require a coding system, um, they have they have they have they have provided us with it in the documentation. So the way to read this documentation is that this this cardinality, this card dot, the cardinality is very important. So if we look at the type over here, it says one dot dot one. So that means the minimum minimum number of type uh, that has to be present is one, and the maximum is one. So like it's a, a long-winded way of saying that type is required. And you can't have more than one of it. So this follows suit for the rest of the attributes. For example, subject, again, it's required. You can only have one of it. So the OP concept can only refer to one patient. You can't have it refer to multiple patients for obvious logical reasons. And again, encounter is required. But over here, if you look at author, it says one and then star. So that means it's required, but you can have as many as you want. Because uh, there can be multiple doctors consulting with the patient for one particular episode. So you can have multiple authors. And in that case, author would be an array. It wouldn't be an object. It would be an array. And I think if I, uh, yeah, you would say yeah. something. Yeah. Apart from the cardinality that you can also see a flag called S. Uh, what it indicates is that the element must be supported. So what that entails is like, for example, in text, you have the cardinality of zero, one thing is it it's your choice whether to support it or not and but if it's used then there's only one of it right and uh, uh, but the thing is if you're parsing a certain uh, file structure if the text is present in the system in the, in the in the artifact then your parser like when you are making sense of the fire data that you've received must support it must display it uh, is is what that extra flag s indicates right Right. So, um, right. So that, yeah, the flag is, is important. You have to, uh, take that into account when specifically when passing the data, uh, while preparing the data, it's the cardinality that matters. And like, like I said, like, for example, text, uh, within, within the type attribute, the text specify you, you, you can choose to add it or you don't have to add it. That is completely, um, your choice, but coding has to be present because the minimum cardinality is one. Um, so, then, uh, so that is that is essentially how you uh, read through the the documentation, the fire documentation. Have you covered you, what star means? Yeah, so star, as I mentioned before, it, it means it's there is no upper yeah. limit. Uh, yeah. You can have multiple. Uh, so, like for example, I said author, you can have multiple authors. You need so, at least one, but you can have more than one if it's one star. If it's zero right. star, you don't need to have it. But if you have it, you can also have like multiple. That's what the cardinality stands for. Right, right. And the, uh, like, for example, the subject over here, uh, the, the, comp the type has been specified as a reference and specifically it's a reference to, um, sorry, it's a reference to a patient, uh, a patient uh, uh, resource. resource. Yeah. So, and it's only a reference. It's not the entire resource as we showed in this. Uh, sorry. Yeah, over here like you in this bundle, we saw that it's just a reference to the patient, right? And the actual patient uh, resource is present in the bundle, but it's present separate. Within the composition, there's just the reference. So, so quick question, is, what is the patient identifier? So that I'm trying to map it with ABDM. In this identifier, you'd put the ABA number, is it? No, no, no. This is an identifier. This is called a COID. Just like a UID is a random uh, string of uh, digits and uh, alphabets this is, a, this is called a cuid it's a specification this is a random cuid that has been assigned to the patient and managing these patient ids is the responsibility of the actual facility of the hip wherever so this patient could be uh, you can add anything patient slash any id you can choose to add our ids also but we recommend for the sake of uniqueness you uh, choose an id whatever your database id is for that patient you add it here and as Ranveer has mentioned beforehand, if you have something in the composition and uh, because uh, we are, there's no fire server as such that uh, the that ABDM is trying to contact, the bundle, uh, whatever references are in the composition have to be resolvable. 
and that's the reason why you need to have the patient resource uh, when he says resolvable what he means is that the full url of this as per the bundle the address of this is patient slash uh, that particular id if you pass it through any particular fire parser if the subject says patient slash some id it should find a patient slash that same id url inside the bundle which would define the entire resource and the same goes for the practitioner resources yes, and, uh, yes id and so on that's correct yes so there's no linking with the say the health practitioners registry uh, id or anything no like that. There, no no they can they can they be, can be yeah yeah but this is something that you define on your end on this is a heuristic that you come up with for your fire bundle okay thank you yeah 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 just like so just to add on to what i said the id the id of the uh, resource itself is as he said uh, completely dependent on you and we've used a cuid but like if you are if you were asking specifically about the identifier within the resource that is again something that you can choose to make like for example i have put the abh address over here but then the system the system value has to match that so i i put the system value as health id or ndhm.gov.in right so that means that that this id is present in this system so if i am putting abh id i have to define the system about it. so um yeah i like i hope that answers uh, your question And, yeah, it does to some extent, but because I'm uh, just trying to link and you know map it to the ABDM sort of thing. But yes. uh, as you said, this is going to be part of the sort of query that has come from before, right? That's why. All right, fine, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Sure. as a general identifier, though, in the full URL, whatever the ID is, it has to be like the ID, the resource ID. Yeah. You can see that CL nine X, whatever yes. it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one uh, quick question while we are talking about the data transformation and uh, other aspects in terms of the storage do you have uh, guidelines say for example any hrp they can use any cloud source right you have google storage you have s3 you have other document storage so is there any specifications uh, done regarding that no 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 there is no specification whatsoever on how you want to store your data or there is no specification that you have to store your data as fire you can store your data in whichever way you want it's just that when you are sending that data to uh, the abdm gateway you prepare it as we discussed again this is a recommendation on you know you can use this way to compose multiple resources and create a bundle uh, but uh, as ranveer would discuss there's also an easier way if you are not able to expend a uh, certain like capital tech capital on this uh, to create all these functions and compositions there's an easier way out also uh, that we will discuss shortly if you can if you can move forward ranveer yeah Yeah, hello yeah. <clears throat> hello yeah we are creating all the uh, description and please, some of the documents can you can you please yeah. hold on let's finish this section and then we'll we'll take questions for this okay, section okay okay thank you thank you right so as i was just saying or uh, like if for some reason so it is recommended you follow this uh, this uh, you 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 create structured fire data made up of multiple resources where each resource is resolvable within the bundle but for um for whatever reason if if that is that is not something that is possible for you at the moment and you uh, abdm has provided a, a sort of a, a, a way out for that uh, where you can send your data in an unstructured format and when i say unstructured i mean something like a pdf so i mean i'm sure there are a lot of um, like it's possible a lot of um, your software all, already have uh, prescriptions generated as pdfs or consultation reports generated as pdfs and if you for whatever reason can't convert that into resource individual resources to create a structured fire bundle you can send it directly as a pdf um so the way you do that is um again it has to be a bundle um it has to be a bundle with a composition resource but that composition resource um as you can see over here uh it it will follow the same structure as normal composition but and you can provide context by giving it a subject reference an author reference and a custodian reference those those are not required at all what is required that in the section array in the entry specifically you refer to a binary resource and that binary resource has to be present within this bundle so as we will see this binary resource is present within the entries array of this bundle and what this binary resource has is uh, is is the content type which uh um, could be application pdf and the data itself which is the pdf in base64 and if you just provide this binary resource on the composition that will work 
that is a legitimate way to transfer your health data in the ABDM ecosystem. So, um, and, uh, and, and, it, and, and it is, uh, you don't have to go through the process of creating individual resources and, and, and you can directly send your content as PDFs. So that is a, that is a possible way out. Um, and, uh, and I think Sai, you, you want to continue? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as we've discussed, these are all the, uh, bundles that have, uh, been, uh, uh, like from the OP console bundle that, uh, uh, has used and in the binary example, when you create file, you also have to validate, ensure as, as the, uh, entity who is creating the, uh, the fire bundle that it's valid that there are no specific errors to ensure the validity of it uh, you uh, can download the validator from this particular link and uh, we will show you yeah the the cli.jr uh, the jar file and you would whatever bundle you create save it as a json file and run it against this jar file and once you do, it would either throw an error or it would say success, like no uh, errors, no, like only like the warnings, are warnings. So this is the way you would run it. That's the command. And uh, this is in, in live in action, like uh, how to run the, here you can see that uh, this is being run against opconsult.json. The bundle would run, it would either give you an error or, uh, so it says that there are certain errors and, uh, uh, those errors would be resolved. Once they are resolved, it would uh, it would say, yeah, uh, your fire bundle is valid. Uh, that way, you can be sure that what you are creating as fire artifact is something uh, that is ready to be sent across whenever there's a request, or your system is properly working when you compose uh, multiple functions to create a fire bundle. So now we move on to the encryption decryption hey, uh, part of uh, it. I have one question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, here they used uh, Java. So that's mm -hmm. why they are using a uh, jar file. If uh, mm -hmm. anyone use another backend language, so then? Uh, you need not uh, have this as a part of your uh, process. Uh, you, you need not have this as a part of your process here in, in a sense that you can just download the tool, ensure that your fire generation, like however we have uh, recommended, however you end up creating those fire, that there is there are no errors in those particular fire processes. So if something is going wrong, it's a good idea to uh, like get that bundle from wherever in whichever way you're generating, save it as a JSON and run against this uh, tool manually to see if there are any errors in your generation process. If they are not, it's it's something of a utility tool, uh, not something that uh, we recommend for you to include because if the validator itself, the video is uh, running in a matter of seconds, it has sped up, but uh, if you run it against a particular JSON, it takes anywhere from uh, three to five minutes. Um, I just have a question on the binary. So okay. we talked about only uh, OP consult, right? But if the binary also involves more than just uh, PDF documents, yeah. uh, do we just get the link of the binary? And uh, uh, how does that work? I'm not uh, uh, Okay, follow. can we go back to the binary bundle? Uh, and... Yeah. So so as you can see, uh, yeah, just come down to the, uh, the binary resource. So what's important in any bundle there are two things, right? Like one, com the composition bundle, uh, composition resource should always be at the top of uh, whatever fire bundle you're generating. And then like whatever you're referring to as such. So in a binary bundle, there are other things that you can add, like who is the practitioner, who is the subject, who is the patient and uh, other meta information. But the most important thing that is required for uh, the binary bundle is this binary resource where you can see the resource type is binary. It obviously has an ID and uh, there is the content type you can see is application slash PDF. And the data would be uh, a base 64 of that PDF. Uh, when we fetch the data as HIU, one of the facilities that we have linked to sends the data as a PDF. So we would see that in action. So this is the most important aspect of a binary thing. And in the composition, if you can uh, scroll up now. Yeah, in the composition, you would, uh, uh, like this section is important. 
Apart from this, if you can scroll up again, all of these uh, things are nice to have in the composition and you would need to have resolvable resources in the bundle as a part of the bundle. But even if you don't have it, you just have that section and uh, you send the actual PDF in question as that particular binary resource and the, uh, the, the MIME type as application slash PDF and uh, the data as base64, everything should work. Uh, my question is that, uh, is there any way to compress the FHR bundle before sending it? Uh, it has to be compressed before it's encrypted. Uh, so whether you're sending a zip file as a binary, uh, then it's not recommended to send a zip file, but like, no, uh, no, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt, uh, not regarding this complete FHR bundle. I want to compress and then send to, uh, uh and then encrypt and then send. So is there, there any way to no, compress the, the, uh, right now? Bundle? No, it's, it's not okay. that you have yeah. to send because it has to be readable at the other end. So that's the standard that you have for the fire money. Okay, because the FHR bundle is so bulky, so yeah. it is so heavy. So that's why I'm asking. That uh, you can split it, it into multiple uh, yeah. entries. And Sorry, uh, uh, my question is also on the same line. Okay. okay. Is okay. The bundles can be customized because it is having multiple APIs in the same bundle. Can we have a customized bundle as well? Yeah, it has to make sense uh, as per the artifact and as per the standards that have been specified by NRCES and uh, AVDM. Uh, you have to follow and in those constraints what you can do you can do but out of those constraints anyway when you're sending the data there is a particular entry section where you can stream the data also uh, that is something that we look into uh, in brief when we uh, come to the actual transfer part of it but for now like this is how you would uh, this is this is just covering the ground on uh, the data preparation part of it aspect of it Hi, hi. Sai, can we take a break now? Or uh, maybe we continue at 3, 3, sure. 3 p.m. We sure, have sure. a question from Ganesh Sivakumar. Uh, I see you have a question. So uh, when we come back at 3 o'clock, so we can start with your question. Uh, I'll, I would like to just quickly summarize on what we've covered before yes. we move for the break. Uh, that's okay. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you can press escape. Uh, and uh, let's just... Uh, give an overview mm -hmm. on all the different things oh, that have been covered. So we've covered the foundational okay. prerequisites. Uh, you can go to the agenda actually. Yeah, so we have covered the, the foundational prerequisites, patient validation, care context linking, and the data transfer part of it. The, the flow we have finished, which is uh, uh, the sequence of APS, we are yet to look at it in uh, demonstration. And we've covered the fire aspect of it. Like after once we come back from the break, uh, we will look at the encryption and the decryption aspect of it and the data transfer demo, uh, uh, like the, the fourth aspect, the fourth point. And once that is done, we will look at the uh, M3 data transfer because we have covered the need of like data preparation and data passing in uh, steps five and six. Uh, seventh would be a short step. And uh, we can take it up uh, from there, from the, from the sixth step. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you all at uh, three. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, Ranvi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. May I please proceed. Thank you. All right. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. And uh, as you can see uh, from this uh, zoomed out view, uh, we've covered until the Fifth uh, section, foundation, if you can scroll down, foundation prerequisites, patient validation, care context linking, and uh, data transfer and fire, and we will move on to the encryption. If you can open the encryption slide. All right, thank you. So uh, we have discussed in brief uh, the data preparation part of it on how uh, we've also given recommendations on how you can compose uh, different resources. Uh, you can think of different resources creation and then compose them uh, together to make a bundle. Now, once you have a bundle, you have to transfer it. Uh, as an HIP, you have to encrypt it and uh, transfer it. And as an HIU, you have to receive the encrypted data, decrypt it and consume it in some form. So, there is a very particular 
And honestly, to share this with you, we feel a little bit convoluted process, but that is the process for encryption and decryption, which we can see in the next slide. Um, so here, uh, if we can start from the HIP side, towards the left of the HIP, you can see that there is a data flow request incoming. So to quickly give you a context on what these different uh, terms are, if you see something uh, of the form DHPK, assume that it's a public key. If you see something of the form DHSK, then that is a private key. So when you get the data flow request, as we have seen uh, previously in the uh, request body, uh, we get an, there's an HI request attribute which has uh, the HIU's uh, public key and a random nonce. So DHPK of you, you denotes the user or the HIU. So you get the uh, both the uh, public key and the nonce and the consent artifact ID and along with it, a data push URL where the HIU expects you to push the data along with the other related material like the key material that you would be generating. So once you get it, get this request, what you have to immediately do as a next part of the flow is to check for the validity of the consent artifact. Remember that uh, the consent is communicated to you before the data flow request in the form of consent request H slash HIP slash notify call. And once you check for its validity, that it is, it is active, it's not revoked, and it is not expired, it uh, is in the date range uh, it, uh, before expiry, then you, what you do is you generate key material for the HIP side. What you do is you generate a public key, a private key, a P denotes provider or HIP, and a nonce value. So you generate your key material. How to generate it is given in detail in the uh, documentation thing. And we'll also sort of discuss an abstraction for this, but let's quickly move through the process of uh, what this process entails. And uh, once you do this, then you generate a shared key. How do you generate a shared key? You take their public key and our private key and you perform an operation on it. So the way in elliptic curve cryptography, this particular uh, mathematical operation stays consistent is a particular private key, uh, our private key and their public key will generate the same shared key as our public key and their private key. So this is something that we use for the encryption and decryption. It cannot work in any other way. And once we generate the shared key, we perform another XOR operation between the nonces, the nonce that we get from the data flow request from the HIU and the nonce that we get, from, nonce that we generated as a part of HIP key material. So this XOR, once we generate the value that's generated uh, is in part used as salt and in part used as the uh, initial vector. Uh, and and uh, where we, use them as one in generating the AES key for encryption. Uh, there's something called the hash key derivation function, uh, uh, which would generate the AES. And for that, we use the shared key and the salt. Uh, salt, I think, is the first uh, uh, first 20 bytes in the ZOR that is generated. And then we encrypt the data using the AES key and the IV, IV is the last, I think, 12 bytes of the generated ZOR. Uh, and with these, you encrypt the data. And once you encrypt the data, you send your like HIP's public key and the random nonce that you generated as a part of this key material along with the encrypted data. So that is the HIP flow of things. Like uh, you get the data flow request and check for consent artifact and the, uh, and the flow, like it, it uh, flows down. And then after that, you send the data flow response the data flow response that you see in the bottom. And on the HIU side of things, things start at the bottom. You get your secret key back, the secret key that you had originally set, uh, uh, generated before sending, whenever you generated your key material. And you get your nonce for this request from DB. You get these values from back in the DB. And then remember that you, the shared key that we've generated 
So one entity is private key and other entity is public key. In whichever way you perform this operation, the shared key generated would be the same. So you generate this shared key and then you perform the ZOR uh, logical operation on the nonces, on our nonce and on their nonce. And ZOR, as we have discussed, generates the salt and IV. And then we use the HKDF to uh, generate the key uh, using the shared key and the salt. And we use this key uh, to decrypt the data. And once we have the data, the HIU has access to the data and HIU will pass the fire data to render it in that particular way. So it is expected for you to implement all of this as a part of HIP and HIU. So, and uh, this is something that as an integrator, we have uh, faced a trouble also because as per the specification, uh, uh, so the public key that's generated uh, in one particular place, it is of uh, 32 bytes, but uh, the public key that we receive as a part of, as an HIP is in one format. And when we are using HIU, as uh, the NDHM HIU or the PHR app, the public key that it expects is in a different format. So there was some sort of ambiguity and there are the, the way implementation has to be done there. Uh, there were a lot of questions around this particular uh, section of uh, the M2 and M3, both encryption and decryption. So what we have done is we have created a tool called Fidelia CLI. And what it does is it abstracts away all these parts. So you don't have to do anything. You just use the tool, it's open source, and it's based off on a tool that was originally meant, but we took it and we made it, uh, for lack of a better word, complete in terms of the experience on treating it in whatever way you receive the public key in whichever format, it'll just work. All you have to do is you'll take the data flow requests, you check for the consent artifact that you still have to do, and the rest of the processes you use for LESCLI for uh, uh, encrypting the data. It has a uh, a very intuitive interface as a CLI. And the best part is, is that because the CLI tool, you can include it as a part of your stack, no matter what your language stack is, like whether you're using Node.js, Ruby, or Python, uh, you can call the sub Fidelia CLI subprocess. It will uh, compute uh, the encrypted form in the case of an HIP, it will compute the decrypted form in the case of an HIU, and uh, it will, uh, uh, it, it'll do its work. So if we sort of uh, move down, uh, there was a, if you can reload this. So there was a, uh, we originally, when we were doing M2, we wanted to have a process that uh, we uh, established and abstracted out for the sake of uh, the NHA community at large so that uh, we all can benefit on our decided consensus on like what the proper ab abstraction is. So if uh, you can open uh, the GitHub link of, uh, yeah, open dev forum. Uh, in here, yeah, who's this? No, sorry, go ahead, I'll let you finish. I'll hold yeah. You. yeah, so we have uh, added a post uh, on the dev forum explaining what Fidelia CLI is and how it functions in the context of an HIP. Of course, you're free to like look at the video, but uh, can you open the actual GitHub, main GitHub link, the Fidelia CLI? Yeah. So uh, this is open source and you can go through the code base uh, at your own leisure. And uh, this is, we have battle tested this. So the way the Fidelia CLI works is it exposes certain uh, API surface. And you can see the commands here. There is the GKM command, which stands for generate key material. You can also give the entire command in its entirety, generate hyphen key hyphen material. Then there is encrypt or E for short, wherein it takes the string to encrypt the sender's nonce, uh, which is their nonce, then our nonce, their uh, like our private key and uh, their public key. And then it'll, it'll encrypt uh, using that particular command. And there are other uh, encryption commands that you can use. For example, sane encrypt uh, was used to uh, provide the uh, data to be encrypted in a base 64 encoded format to escape the JSON characters. Uh, and then there was also a file path command that was developed so that uh, if there are any limitations as such 
in the CLI as to because the, the uh, fire artifacts can get uh, really lengthy. So you can give these parameters as a part of the file. And that's what we would be uh, seeing in the demonstration today. If we can scroll down a little bit. So you can see these are the commands that are in play, like uh, this is a bash shell, wherein I am invoking for alias CLI and uh, uh, I'm invoking the GKM command. It would give me the private key, the public key, the X509, public key in the X509 format and the nonce. So the public key that we get as an HIP from either the PHR app or the uh, or the HIU app is in the first public key format, like in the first format. But HIU expects us to send it in the HIU uh, that we use in particular, the uh, NHS HIU, uh, would expect the public key in the X509 format. No matter what the constraints are on the receiving uh, uh, end, on the facility end, if you use Fidelia CLI, no matter how you're receiving the public key, it is abstracted out the encryption and decryption uh, should work seamlessly. And uh, uh, down below, there are examples on encryption and decryption, where uh, there is, uh, like, if you can scroll up a little bit. Uh, yeah, so here you can see that uh, the E command is used, and uh, that is the, uh, the text to be encrypted, and the nonces and the private key and the public key, and you get the encrypted data. And uh, then in the decryption, you use the same encrypted data as the data to be decrypted uh, uh, in place of data to be decrypted. And then you have the nonces and the uh, public key and the private key uh, and uh, private key and the public key, sorry, that order is important. And you get the decrypted data. And in the file path flag, you can use Fidelia CLI. You can like look at the second segment of the file path uh, example where you're using Fidelia CLI with the file path uh, uh, flag and you are giving the params as a text file and the params contain the commands, the, whether you want to decrypt, encrypt, and the data to be decrypted or encrypted, the nonces, then the private key, and then the public key. And you get the decrypted data in this particular format. So a point of note is also that we have an examples folder. Uh, if you can open the examples folder, um, wherein we give examples on how you can consume Fidelius as a part of your stack. Uh, let's quickly look at Node. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, we are just sort of getting the path to the Fidelius CLI pin and executing it as a sub process using the execute sync command. And whatever uh, result that we do get, uh, we uh, consume it. And we have like different helper functions for encrypting the data, and for CN encrypting the data, for uh, uh, decrypting the data, uh, and uh, like there's an there is a run example command which sort of strings together uh, the, the the entire use case. So that is a Fidelius uh, CLI in short. Uh, I think it's uh, time for demonstration. Let's quickly go through the demonstration before taking questions. Uh, or actually, if you have certain questions on Fidelia CLI and the encryption decryption process, uh, let's have it. Yeah, I uh, this is Hari here. So I have a couple of questions. The first is, uh, do we have a specification for the key management? Because there's a lot of PKI floating around here. So is there a write-up of how the key is managed and who's responsible for the key management? Uh, the key management is your responsibility as a facility who is building this. Like even in Fidelia CLI, we do not have any specification on how you would manage your keys. Okay. You can generate as many key material uh, objects as you can. Uh, but to sort of identify, if you remember, we were discussing the whole flow uh, in the beginning where uh, there is a particular call, either the gate initiates it or the HRP initiates it. And then there's a callback. That callback responds to a particular request. How you would want to chain those together, uh, how you would manage them is your responsibility on storing a, a, a chain uh, and how you want to design that data is uh, your prerogative. Similarly, even here for the key material that's being generated, uh, it's HIU's responsibility when it is generating the key material to store it in the database to use it again. And it's HIP's responsibility uh, to, before encrypting it, uh, it has a record of the key material that it generated 
to encrypt the data. Of course, as an HIP, once you send the encrypted data, there is no use for it. You can discard it, but uh, it's good to keep a record. Uh, that okay. specification is on you completely. Okay, but uh, how about the strength of the encryption, right? I mean, so if you have to go for AES 128, 256, or RSA, uh, you know, uh, 4096, whatever is it, right? It is, right? So uh, how do we make a choice of that? Uh, so there's no choice here. Uh, that's what I, I'm uh, saying. And like rest assured, the encryption that's used here is, is pretty strong in the in the industry. It's a AS two fifty six and it's uh, elliptic curve cryptography. So it's specifically that. But this as a standard has been uh, mandated by ABDM that you are supposed to send it in. Uh, you are supposed to encrypt the data in this particular format. As of now, there is no choice for you to uh, select a different algorithm of sorts. You have okay. to go through. Okay, yeah. and uh, the last question from my end is, uh, so the key length uh, determines the uh, payload size that we can encrypt, right? So that means we have to take care of chunking the data and doing all that and they, uh, assume that That's the HIU- not true, no. Like, uh, like you can, uh, the data can be, uh, in the constraints of the uh, elliptic curve cryptography, the Diffie-Hellman, there is no specification on, there's no limit on like the data that you can encrypt and uh, it should uh, in all intents uh, be able to uh, properly encrypt the data. It's just that in, in the bundle that you're creating, just ensure that you're creating like atomic uh, bundles in the sense that uh, uh, the bundles are not uh, uh, Tacking on all the uh, uh, encounters, like one for one visit, uh, you can have one prescription bundle, and then you can call the data push URL as many times as you can. So as long as you're doing this, there is no specific limitation, and okay. we have tried it with yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. and and Fidelis Fidelis CLI will be maintained and support will be provided by you guys. Fidelis CLI is an open source uh, uh, platform, and of course, if there are any issues, we are happy to help. And because the code is open and you can audit it yourself on how the encryption is happening, how the decryption is happening. Uh, we do not provide official support, but uh, as the core custodians of the library, uh, we do respond to issues and we do respond to queries on the uh, tool uh, specifically. In that essence, uh, I would also request uh, the community at large uh, to sort of engage with us on the GitHub. Uh, if you can open the GitHub, uh, uh, URL. Yeah. Amir, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, uh, uh, you can engage with us on this particular URL. Uh, if there are any issues, you can post your issues in this particular section, and we will uh, look at them. And please also consider starting the repository at the uh, uh, corner, top corner. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on to the demonstration on uh, the right. the whole data transfer and how Fidelia CLI is used first as an HIP. Right. Uh, all right. So um, so to uh, to do the data transfer, I'm going to be using um NHA's uh HIU web interface to initiate the consent request. Um, so as uh, as I had covered, the first uh, step in uh, in the data transfer process uh, is is the consent request, which is initiated by an HIU. This could be the user, or um, it could be the patient itself, or it could be like uh, um, an, an, a doctor or someone requesting data. So I'm gonna open the uh, web interface and Right, so this is the this is the HIU web interface. Um, so for uh, it, it, to get login credentials for this, I, I think you need to contact your NHA Spark, and they'll provide you the details. I'm already logged in, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, request and create a consent for uh, the patient that uh, we had been uh, we'd added care contacts for. Um, so I'm gonna enter the patient identifier, which is my other address. And we press this and purpose of request, uh, we can choose from these, we make it self-requested. And uh, this is where we have to enter the date range. I think before the break, someone had asked the question about this. So 
the date range that that the patient or the HIU specifies over here has to be respected by the HIP. So when the consent request is received, uh, the response of the HIP will be determined by this date range. So they will only fetch or return the data for the care context that have been linked within this date range. So, um, because we, this hub address is new, it doesn't matter. And like all of the consents who have been linked today. So I'm going to, um, just, um, take an arbitrary date range health info type, uh, for just for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm just going to do OP consultation, but obviously all of the HI types are available and, uh, you also have to enter a consent expiry, which we can just keep for any future date. Um, and uh, I mean, it's important because after, after when once the consent expired, the uh, the HIU will not have access to the data anymore. So that is important. But for right now, I'm just taking a, a, a future date. So once I click on request consent, the consent is initiated, and I have to go onto the PHR app and uh, and uh, and and accept this consent. So let me share my screen over there. Right, so uh, on my screen, if I go to the consents tab and I, oh, my session expired, let me re-log in. I'm going to log in with the particular Arbor address for which I requested the consent. And we can see that this is the consent I just uh, created. The details of this consent, you can see it was self-requested, the date range, I requested OP consultation. As the patient, you can choose to deny the request. Um, you can edit this consent request by editing the, the information that you want to provide when it's expiring and all of that. But uh, we're going to go ahead and grant the consent. And... Um, Oh, because it's a new address, we're creating a new pin. And once the consent is granted, um, we on uh, on our callback URL will receive a uh, will receive a notify call. Um, so if I go back here, we can see over here we've received a notify call. Um, and if I expand the notify, your, your screen yeah. is not shared. Oh, that's so, sorry, my bad. Let me switch back. And where is the, you know, sorry. Right, is my screen visible? Yeah. Yeah, so we can see we received this notify call. Uh, this notify, uh, it's uh, consent slash HIP slash notify. And uh, if I expand uh, the notification and the consent detail, uh, we can see that the request has been made for these two uh, these two can scare context references, both of which we had linked before the break as part of uh, the linking process. One but in the form, where did you ask for the care context? I'm, I'm sorry, I think I missed something. But in the form when you requested, where did the care context no. come in? Uh, and so we don't require, we don't explicitly request for a particular, what, what that consent does is it's requesting. So this notify calls go out to all HIPs who have data for this patient. And the, 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 if, if you recall, when we, uh, we talked about in the linking process that the gateway gateway maintains a record of which HIP has, which care context, like they don't maintain a record of what the data is related to that care context, but they know that this particular visit, visit uh, 99999 is linked with this demo uh, workshop HIP. And that is why the gateway is sending this call, telling this HIP that we know you have data for this particular care context reference and the patient or the HIU is requesting that. So just so, to sort of like re-summarize that, given at uh, the behest of the process, like when you start this, HIU doesn't know uh, what care context it, it wants because how would it know? It doesn't. Uh, all it does is get in the consent, it says, I want the health data from this particular date to this particular date, the records that have been generated during that particular date. And uh, it, would, it can also request, uh, uh, I want uh, OP consult, all OP consult types, all uh, prescriptions generated during that, it can give it. And once the patient accepts that, they can edit the consent to allow only prescriptions for say, let's say, or they don't want to sort of send prescriptions. But what if I want only diabetic visits to come through? 
and I know as HIU that I want only diabetic visits to come through. Uh, that is something that you have to build on your end because diabetic visits is not a category uh, that uh, so ABDM care the context. Are. Therefore, what is the use? The care con- I'm 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 going to come there. Like when you sort of start this as an HIU and you sort of say Ki, we want this particular data. What the uh, what the gateway does is it sends a notification call to all the HIPs where the data is present, as Ranveer was saying. And it will say, these are the care contexts that are present under you as a facility. And uh, a patient has requested that they send in the consent that these all care contexts must be sent because they have requested requested all of the data. So as a HIP, you have to follow the consent. Uh, you do not decide as an HIP, ki I will. I only would want to send diabetic. As a HIP, you will send all the things. And when as HIU, when you get the data, we will cover the HIU flow also. There you can uh, loop through all the data that you have got. And probably at your process layer, you can build a filter which would identify this is a diabetic visit or this is a some sort of an other uh, uh, like a mental therapy visit or, or or all the other instances that they are. You can build a filter on the HIU end, but there is no filter at the ABDM gateway level or at immediately at the HIU receiving level where you can categorize it based on uh, a, a particular disease or a particular condition. You will get all the data as per the consent that has been generated at the HIU end. Hope that makes it clear. Thanks. Yeah. What, what, uh, one question here. So let's say uh, the patient has migrated between various HIP uh, providers. Are we saying all the systems have to be like exactly uh, available what together? About maybe multiple providers also. I mean, uh, repositories yes. also. Yes, yes. So, uh, so, so uh, are if we there are mul- multiple availabilities yeah. of multiple HIV uh, provisions? And then yes. all of them will have to keep on responding and up and running, right? That's correct. That's correct. So like if there are to work. That's correct. Uh, if it, there it's are multiple... a high, high, it's, it's a high high availability assumption that has been built into this. That much I can say at this point. That's correct. If you are running an HIP service, you are uh, supposed to sort of respond. If you are integrating with the system, it, it is uh, uh, on the onus is on you to sort of provide the data. For example, there are multiple HIPs where the patient has gone through. So let's and... say. So let's say for a, for a critical event, right? Let's say in that period there was one critical event that happened for the patient. And unfortunately, that HIP may not be up and running at that point in time because of their own downtime and other issues. So that particular critical medical data has actually gone missing in the process. Yeah, that is the onus on the HIP who is running the... So that's the reason why there are multiple outs in the ecosystem also, like Health Locker. Like Health Locker can also act as an HIP where uh, they could sort of send the data. So there are multiple like fail states have also been thought of into the design. And right now we are at a very nascent stage of uh, different entities joining in together. But the whole vision is this, that uh, the uh, that longitudinal care for a particular patient can be provided. Just to sort of finish that for completion sake, if a particular patient has their record spread across different multiple facilities, all those particular different HIPs would be hit uh, uh, wherein, uh, and then those HIPs are supposed to respond. And on top of this, there are other aspects of it also, like there is a health monitoring uh, endpoint with which the gateway will keep track on whether the HIP is functional or not. And based on that information, they might do, they might add in some additional uh, safe checks uh, in the future. But, uh, uh, but to answer your question, that's how it's supposed to function, yes. I have related question. What is the incentive to the hospital information provider to basically send this information? Why why they will do that? It's a it's a scale thing. Uh, like if if uh, multiple organizations come together and participate in this uh, as, together, they are not only sort of yes, the the onus is on you to provide the health. Uh, benefit but you are also like the patients who are coming to you if they're coming from different facilities you also have rich uh, history and you can provide better care that's the intent but uh, is like, there any any incentive program from government side like uh, that you have to take up with nha and i'm not uh, uh, okay. Yeah, okay. i don't have the agency to comment on that okay. uh, 
uh, I would request that we finish the flow and uh, as, as soon as we finish the flow, we'll take questions on this particular section. Please go ahead, Ranveer. Right, right. So, um, so as I was saying, we've received this notify call and um, we've received it because um, we the this patient had uh, had had a care context linked with this HIP and there were two care contacts. So within the same notify call, we've got a request for both the data linked with both those care contacts. And um, and now uh, what we have done on Pipe Dream is that uh, again because of uh, uh, to automate the process in uh, where it, it, I'll just really quickly touch upon this. Well, so we've we've configured it to respond to the notify call with the with the required on notify call. So the body for the on notify call, uh, uh, just to briefly cover it, is is that uh, the, once the data is received and the HIP HIP um, validates that these care contacts, uh, first of all, that the patient is is registered with the HIP. Second, that these care contacts are valid and are also present and there's data, um, uh, there's data linked to them. And third, that they fall within the date range that has been specified. The uh, HIP is going to send back an acknowledgement with the status OK. If any of these checks fail, for example, if the patient is only not present or like if the care contacts that have been requested are not present or for some unforeseen reason, something goes wrong and there is no data, the data that is being requested is not available at the HIV. There are corresponding error codes that you have to send back. Those have been documented in the ABDM documentation. So, um, uh, the, that has to be that has to be taken care of by the HIP. Uh, you have to send the correct error code back if something goes wrong. For the purpose of demonstration, we send back an acknowledgement saying okay, and we have to reply. Uh, we have to send an okay next to the consent request ID that has been sent in the notify call. And uh, once this is done, we we hit the on notify API. And when the gateway receives the on notify API, it uh, it it uh, obviously communicates that to the HIU, and the HIU sends a formal request. And uh, we get we have got the request because we automatically responded with the notify on notify. We got the request call as well. Now, as I covered in the theory, uh, the request uh, the the request API is where we have all the key material data. So we have the public key that the HIU has sent. This is the HIU's public key and the HIU's nonce. This is what we will be using to encrypt the data, which I will just uh, demonstrate. And we also have the data push URL where we have to, uh, where the HIP has to send the data directly. Because once again, this is out of band. The gateway is not involved in the data push part of it. You directly send it to the data push URL that the HIU is specified. So uh, once again, I'll demonstrate that using Postman as well. And the consent, uh, the consent attribute again just has the consent ID. Um, and this entire request call has been attributed to transaction ID, which also we have to send back when we are hitting the data push URL. So um, to to essentially identify that we are uh, responding to this particular request call with this data. So, um, so uh, like having covered all of that, I'll now just, I'll, I'll, I'll encrypt uh, the data and send it. So uh, for the purposes of this demonstration, we have uh, made some uh, dummy, uh, we made a dummy file server of sorts that generates uh, dummy health records in fire format. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using this get OP console demo API. And uh, I'm going to hit it and uh, get, uh, this is an OP console record in proper fire format. So um, I'm going to be using this. I'm going to be encrypting this data and sending it to the, uh, the HIU where, where it, once we sent it using the proper encryption and everything, it will be displayed on the web interface. So I'm going to get started on that. Um, let me just, I'm going to copy the data and we will be using Fidelius CLI to do that. So uh, I have my terminal open. And, uh, and let me just quickly show you that Fidelius CLI is present in the folder. I mean, can I already you, have it downloaded. Can you zoom in a bit? Can you zoom in a yeah. bit? So I'm just gonna reshare my screen. It seems to be frozen. Uh, is my screen frozen? Can can you just confirm that for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yes. Just give me one good second.
I have a query regarding repository value. Can I ask now or later? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so for the HRP, so we need to implement it on the method. It's a common URL, or we need to implement for the different different clients and for the different different URLs. Uh, you mean the HRP? Yeah, yeah. The, I'm, the HRP. I'm talking about the HRP. Like we yeah. are a product. We we have a, a software product. Okay. So. i'm i'm talking about the repository url so right. it's different for the clients or it's a common for the software so for one client id that you would get you could have one url no matter how many number of facilities you serve behind that uh, one client okay. id would serve. okay thank so, you thank you thank you i think that we is back up yeah 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 right so uh, as i was saying i uh, i just to, like Uh, so everyone, I have to tell you CLI downloaded. So I'm going to directly go ahead and encrypt the uh, data. Can you also give them uh, one more time where they can download the Delia yeah. CLI? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, if you if I go to the GitHub page, um, over in on the right, the releases. If I go on releases, you can see the latest version, which is one point two point zero. Has is available to download. You can download it as a zip file, and um, and you you should be able to follow the documentation and use it the way I'm going to be demonstrating. Now. Can you just copy paste the URL in the chat, please? We'll download it from there if you don't mind, Ranveer. Thank you. I, I'll do that. I'll do that, Ranveer. Right, right, right. Thank you, bro. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Right, so uh, so now uh, let's get started with the encryption. So we are going to use the uh, use the file path method uh, that Sai briefly touched upon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a file and I'm going to call it encryption params. Uh, I'm going to call it encryption params dot txt. So it's going to be a txt file, and um, we're going to open it and we're going to add the parameters, uh, the parameters uh, to uh, encrypt the data. So just give me one sec. I think it opened up another screen. Yeah. So let me just pull it up. Right. So um. Yeah. Yeah. So the first the first thing that you have to enter is the command. So that's going to be encrypt. If uh, followed by the actual data itself, uh, which I had copy pasted. So this is the entire file bundle that comes next. After that, uh, you can enter. You have to. Uh, you have to put the nonces. So the order of the nonces doesn't matter. You could put uh, the HIPs nonce first or the HIUs nonce first. It 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 is. Uh, it's academic. It doesn't matter. We can. Um, so let me just go back and copy the um, the nonce that we received. So I'm going to take the nonce that we received from the from the HIU in the request call. And I'm going to copy it and paste it over here. Uh, then I'm going to uh, take uh, um, our nonce. Uh, so sorry, quick thing that I actually forgot to do. I have to generate the HIPs key material, right? So um, so what the command for that, as I had mentioned, is gkm. So it's you invoke the Fidelio CLI with the gkm command, and it should generate the key material that you need. So I'm gonna. This is the HIP scheme material. The HIUs we got from the request call. So I'm gonna copy the nonce, and uh, I'm gonna paste it here. And then we also. What comes next is the private key. So the our private key. So that's something I'm gonna copy paste. And the last thing is the public key of the HIU, which we get from the request call. So I'm gonna. This is the key value. And I'm gonna copy it and paste it here. And uh, so that is everything. Once again, to reiterate the order, we first have the command followed by the actual data to encrypt. Then the two nonces. Uh, the order doesn't matter. Then the private key, and then the public key. So I'm gonna save this and close it. And then I'm gonna go back to my terminal. And I'm going to run the, uh, I'm going to run the Fidelio uh, CLI command with the file path, and then I have to give the the path. So it's encryption params because I'm in the same folder, and it should give me back the encrypted data. So you can see it's encrypted data with the string, which is the encrypted data itself. So I'm going to copy paste the encrypted data to send.
Right. So now we come to the data push part of it. So over here in the in the URL, we have to enter the the data push URL that the HRU has communicated to us. So we can see over here, this is the data push URL. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to use that as the, I, the I think that's already there as a part of so HIU endpoint. The first, uh, the third. In oh, sorry, that's my bad. Yeah. Wrong thing. Yeah, sorry, that's my bad. I'm wrong. Yeah. So that is the, 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 the URL. And then uh, in the body, uh, we have to enter the transaction ID. So the transaction ID we get from the request call again, and that's going to be pasted here. And then the content is going to be the entire content that I had copied. So that is the encrypted data. So I'm going to paste that in the content field in the entries array. And uh, after that, we have to enter the, uh, we have to, we have to generate a checksum. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the entire encrypted string and generate an MD5 hash of it. So uh, uh, no, no, the it's before encryption. So the the reason for uh, having yeah. checksum there is that uh, before the the data is encrypted, you perform a checksum an MD5 on the encrypted thing and sends as a part of the data push URL. And once HIU receives the uh, whole body request body and they decrypt it, they would verify that the generated part uh, checksum matches the checksum that we are sending. Although that is the intent of this, uh, we have noticed that many of the participating facilities are not using the checksum part of this properly, uh, but that's the intent of it. That's that's why the, the, the checksum attribute is there. Uh, can you skip this part, uh, checksum part? Uh, you can skip it, but uh, it's recommended that you don't because uh, it's an added uh, layer of uh, security uh, that uh, you are giving, uh, like you are proving your integrity when you're sending the data. So ideally you shouldn't. Right. So I've, uh, I generated uh, an MD5 hash of the, uh, the unencrypted data and I've added it to the checksum field. Uh, the care context reference uh, has to obviously match the care context you're sending it for. So we can get that from the notify call. I'm going to be responding to the, the first visit that we linked. So that is the care context reference. So I'm going to paste it here. And uh, then so again, to clarify what Ranmir is saying, that you have to send, you have to hit this URL, the data push URL, whatever URL you are sending. Uh, with for all the care contexts. So you can see that entry is itself an array uh, with the, the content encrypted and uh, the media and the checksum and everything. So if you have a different care context, you would just add uh, an extra element in this particular array, but we are just responding it for one care context reference for the sake of this demonstration. But you are supposed to uh, respond with all the care contexts that are in the consent if you have those care contexts. Right. And uh, and also, uh, so in the key material uh, for this particular HIU that we're using, the NHA HIU web interface, the key has to be in X509 format. As I was mentioning, uh, this was one peculiarity of uh, this particular uh, this particular uh, HIU. So uh, Fidelius generates the public key in both the X509 as well as the other format. So we can just copy paste it from here. And um, I'm gonna paste it back. And we also need the nonce, which uh, we can again get from here. And once we have that, I think we have everything we need for for uh, this API call. Uh, one thing is that this this uh, this particular API endpoint does not have any headers because you're sending it out of band directly to the HIU. So um, that's why it makes sense that there are no headers and we can just directly hit it. And it says 202 accepted. Um, if I go back to the web interface that I had open and reload the page, um, the we can see that the consent status and all should change. And when I click on this, and I can see that the ABDM workshop facility uh, OP consultation report 
has in fact been transferred and is rendered properly. We can see all of the diagnosis and the medications that were prescribed. So um, the data transfer uh, worked and encryption, decryption, everything seemed to have worked smoothly. Uh, so yeah, that I think wraps up the uh, HIP side of the data transfer. Yeah, yeah. Encryption has worked, the encryption that you have done and the HIU has successfully decrypted it. And uh, so that I think concludes this uh, section on the data transfer as an HIP. If you have any questions, uh, let's take them before moving on to the, the HIU side of things. Uh, actually, we are facing the issue of uh, notify call is not receiving uh, uh, immediately after link confirm call. That is our uh, issue we are facing. Sorry, you're talking about discovery? Uh, yeah, discovery after link okay. confirm. The yeah, notify yeah. call is not receiving on our server. I see. Uh, can we take that those in that particular section, Abhikele? Like uh, what we will do, what we shall do is we'll cover the encryption the encryption part of this specifically. And if you have any specific questions, let's uh, uh, have uh, twenty minutes for that also. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, another question is that uh, in MD five generator, uh, we uh, we have to use encrypted data or uh, normal data to. Uh, normal data, normal data. Again, as I was explaining, the intent of the checksum being there is that before encrypting, you will uh, create the create the checksum, uh, and then at the end of it, you would add it as a part of the transfer. And once the HIU receives the data, they would decrypt it, and then they can they can perform an MD5 checksum on the received data. It should match with the checksum that you have sent. Uh, thus proving the integrity of the data that they have received. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any okay. more questions? Um, may I, ask, yeah. I have a question. May I ask? This is Hari yeah. from Chennai. Hi, Hari. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so like we discussed, the HIT has to send uh, data after the after they receive the API call, right? So, is there mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the HIU also sends the uh, expiry of the keys that they sent along with the uh, data request that they uh, uh, you know sent to the ABDM gateway. Is there mm -hmm. anything else that um, you know um, provides information to the HIP on how long uh, can we wait to this you know for this data transfer to complete? Because um, in practical world, the doctor has to wait for all that all the HIPs to communicate to the HIU, and then uh, only then the doctor can proceed with diagnosis. So. Uh, how long the SAC HIU has to wait for at uh, least uh, the yes. maximum time span of it? Again, so that depends on uh, right now, there is no strong specification on uh, on when HIP because it is completely asynchronous. Uh, the HIP can take its time. Uh, ideally, the uh, facilities that we have interacted with, they send the data instantaneously, but uh, you can take uh, uh, a couple of hours also to send the data. And uh, as as far as the expiry thing is concerned, the HIU can specify it in the key material, the when would their public key expire. And uh, so HIP can sort of take it as an indication uh, on how quickly they want to respond to this, to the particular request. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, how do we know if any issues are there in the data processing? Is there any transaction logs or how we debug? So as I mentioned, one, if the if for the preparation of data itself, there is the fire validator that we have covered in the first segment of this workshop. Uh, and if the encryption decryption is not happening, uh, again, like uh, the whole the process of encryption decryption uh, as uh, the, the entirety of it was put on, the onus was on the integrator before, and there were a lot of errors, but uh, uh, thanks to like Fidelia CLI, uh, now we have abstracted that process to this particular thing. And you focus on, on ensuring that you do all other aspects in the, in the flow properly. And uh, if there are any specifications on like, if something has gone wrong in encryption wise, uh, then probably you can send the payload on the dev forum and we can like somebody from NHA can also respond. They can look at the logs keyword has gone wrong. They have their own logging system. And uh, I think this is something that uh, 
uh, we are also waiting for so that we can have better access to the locks uh, uh, if there is anything that has gone wrong. But for now, the idea is to sort of communicate it on the dev forum if anything has gone wrong. No, so after 202 is accepted because whatever we send, it is uh, shows that 202 is accepted. Uh -huh. but, uh, but where is the issue? Like we sometimes it won't reflect in the PHR app or the HR right. web UI. Right. Right. So is there any callback URL that it will shows that this uh, particular transaction has these, these issues? Unfortunately, going to the dev forum or all these. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, no. I mean, I don't know of specifically any other way for you to sort of know because nothing is publicly accessible in this regard. Uh, but you can sort of uh, have an idea on what went wrong. Either there is a problem. There, there, there are only like uh, two choices where you can go wrong. Either you have not encrypted the data properly. Either you have not uh, sent the body properly. Or uh, your fire uh, uh, format, fire resource has issues. So fire validator is something, there's something actionable that you can do. You can ensure that the fire you're sending it properly uh, in, in that particular format. You can ensure that uh, you are sending the uh, body of it. If you can look at the body done here uh, of the data push you are on. Yeah. So addition to that, uh, something uh, let, let me just let me just complete this uh, question answer please. sorry uh, so like please ensure that uh, you uh, are sending the uh, body in this particular format so page number is supposed to ideally start with again i don't think they have a strict mandate on how you have to send page number and page count but as far as the industry standard or as far as like the communication standards are concerned the page numbers would start with a zero index and page count would start with, like, for example, if you have two pages, uh, there would be page number zero and one, and the page count would be two. And that's the way you would uh, process on your HIP and also, and uh, ensure that you are following the, uh, uh, sending the transaction ID and sending it as a part of the entries and scroll down, please. Right. And uh, you would be sending the key material and with proper, uh, uh, expiry DH public key and uh, that the expiry is sufficiently set into the future at least a few uh, uh, hours from whenever you're sending the call and the nonces and after all of this if you've ensured that you've sent it correctly uh, and uh, and we recommend highly recommend to use for LACLI because it has been battle tested uh, then then unfortunately there's no other way than to contact uh, uh, someone from the nha uh, your point of contact or put it on the dev forum too uh, well, uh, one thing that i, I just uh, like that to what i said that um, like uh, yeah the best thing would be to look at the the the, the body of the call you're sending uh, but one thing that could help is if you use nha's hiu web interface um, and uh, if you send the data and it still says 202 accepted and you can't see the data over there, you could um, maybe use some uh, very basic uh, debugging techniques, look at the inspect log over there, and you, you can see if your data has been received or not. And if it has been, it's showing as received over there, then it's a problem with uh, with your the way you've done fire. Because That's the, a good point. You, yeah. That's yeah a good what point. is that uh, tool? How do we inspect? You can yeah. just right click in and click on inspect and look at the console in, in the browser. I mean, if I, if I like, yeah, really yeah. yeah. Okay. that is the inspect tool. What yeah. Okay. Additionally, please don't base uh, your uh, uh, testing on the PHR app. Please use the HIU app. The credentials for this will be shared with you uh, by your NHA contact or yeah. you can request it on the dev forum. And uh, PHR app is known to be faulty in these cases. Uh, so if it's not working for you on the PHR app, Probably not necessarily there is something wrong with you. Uh, it's just that PHR app acting up the, the SPX version of it. What you can do is you can use this HIU interface and if you're still facing the issue, then probably there is something wrong. And uh, it will also sort of uh, try to, if, if you cannot get any indication or any information from this activity also, then uh, it's a good idea to uh, contact the initiative. Right. Right, like I mean, if you can see on the screen, I, I just went on the console and you can see that the data is there. And if, if you're, so first of all, you can just use this to check if your data is even being received. And if it is being received and not rendered, then you know it's a problem with the way you, you bundled your resource. Yeah. So uh, I would suggest first check that. I think uh, in the first page itself, the arrow mark was not displaying sometime. 
even uh, you after clicking on arrow only you are coming to this page right uh, no i think that's i have never faced that issue even like at times when maybe the bundle wasn't being rendered correctly the arrow would always show up as long as you've accepted the consent so it's never been the case that if you've not accepted the consent the arrow doesn't show up at least for me i've never faced that situation so um okay. like yeah as long as you accept the consent request from the phr app the it'll be enabled yeah yeah i think error map was coming but here there was some uh, error message in the top in the red color yeah. something, something there was some um, uh, notification was coming yeah that's likely that either your data hasn't been transferred correctly or the file format isn't correct i would recommend you just uh, you okay. like inspect it and see what's happening yeah so uh, the one last question uh, the examples you have taken is it uh, you have taken from only the nrcs examples only right yeah uh, we based yeah. off of uh, on nrcss originally and then we have just added based on the recommendations given there we have uh, built our own fire building process and uh, from there is the we will share uh, the dummy uh, things that, that ranveer was using the consultation report whatever the fire thing uh, that he has used to generate this we will share that also with you along with uh, the the slides and yeah, sure. other those resources. examples if you share that will be helpful we can yeah, you. yeah sure sure All right. Hi, we have two uh, raise hand features. You know, uh, I think Ganesh, Shiva Kumar, and Sri yeah. Sri Kanta Sri Kanta Mukherjee. Ganesh, can you can you can you yeah. present your question, please? Ah, uh, I have a doubt in creating consent uh, consent request. In consent request, we request only the OP consultation. Yeah. What yeah. if we if we added two or more? Uh, request like documents uh, diagnosis or that how we how we can prepare data for that for so to, you, for... you would prepare it in the similar vein as uh, how you would prepare for op consult ganesh uh, you would uh, if you get the request uh, in the consent uh, if there is a care context reference that you have that particular care context reference if that care context reference can be constructed as an op consult as a prescription then you would send them as a part of like different bundles if you have two different artifacts you can use the data push url as many times as you want and once the uh, against that transaction id of course against that transaction id if you send both of them they will be uh, received by the hiu and whatever the hiu use it it will render correctly uh, under for example you can see that this is a consultation report document similarly there would be okay. a different document which is a prescription thank you how 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 key how they identify its consultation or uh, uh, some other documents Why so it depends it depends on the fire when when you are generating the fire there is a resource type there is a, where in the resource type the, the, there there's a bundle type also in the bundle type they would, you would sort of okay, have okay. consultation report here. yeah yeah that's all okay thanks thank you yeah, thank you uh i have a question regarding that uh, web interface so we are creating the consent request for like uh, for the op consultation so do we have any end point from our end we can create that uh, request in the postman collection or i'm sorry i didn't catch your question can you repeat that so fr from this nhe portal we create a op consultation request right mm -hmm. so which end point i have to use for uh, like uh, for this uh, i think that's what has been covered uh, you would have to this is the data push url particularly you have to push the data in that particular format if you sort of this the recording will be given to you uh, in which the flow that has been covered on how to start it if you can go refer to that then you will find your answer thank you okay okay yeah srikanta ji if you can go ahead yes please. yeah so so i think the use case that you just ran us through uh, that was around that the hiu is requesting for a document right Right. that was the use case you flew, flew through and it took a encryption decryption finally how the prescription looks just the encryption part we have uh, looked at yeah. the decryption happened behind the scenes for it yeah. Uh, yeah yeah behind the scenes uh, yeah. what about the other use case so let's say the point of generation of this document yeah. right uh, wouldn't a hip like to uplink this document into uh, storage uh, like like an fhr compliant way uh, like how that use that. case flow the thing is you can do that we generate this on demand the thing is the way we have a particular uh, data model on how we store consultation reports and like uh, chief complaints or like prescription medication 
So uh, we have our own database model and that can differ from uh, HI, HIMS to HIMS based on how they have structured their database. But to uh, sort of send it as a fire format, we have, as we were also recommending you on how you can do it, uh, you can generate, uh, you can create a bunch of functions for creating individual so that resources. Is clear. That yeah. is clear, that, that part yeah. is clear, that the wrapping into FHIR is clear, the bundle is clear. Now, yeah. Yeah. This was an on-demand production yeah. of this file, right? Yes. What about the time of generation? So let's say this prescription at the point, it got generated, yes. right? Yes. How do I uplink the document to the patient records? Uh, we don't uplink right now. We like, as soon as there's a particular request, we generate the fire uh, JSON and uh, we encrypt it and then we send it over uh, to the data push to URL. We don't see the need for uplinking it. Whenever there is a request from the ABDM ecosystem, our functions would on demand to generate this file. Got if it. you so choose, then you can have, please look into, there is something called fire at rest. Uh, you can use that particular methodology there, where there is a database where you can store the fire uh, specific artifacts. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So that because what you're saying is that we will have the local database, the local data of this particular prescription always as it is in the proprietary, right? In, in our yes. own formats. Yes. Subsequently, only on a demand basis, we are going to flow this data. Correct. 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 Absolutely. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, one, one issue you are, uh, I am facing. Yeah. Yeah, that I uh, I uh, rip the for a single record entry, I am getting multiple uh, records in uh, PHRF. Uh, for example, I am I am creating a appointment and one record is generated. Then after some time in the PHRF, it gets duplicated for the same entry in PHRF. Uh, so, I again, as I've uh, uh, said before, uh, it's good that things are working for you on PHRF, but I think for the uh, sake of completion tests, uh, please use the HIU interface. It's uh, it's it's solid in all ways. Okay. And uh, yeah. thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we move on to the uh, M three section? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have covered all the flows uh, with all the requirements that. Uh, I think we have not left anything specifically. I think there's one point that we have not demonstrated. That is the notify at the end of data push. If you can go back to that slide, please. Uh, after the data push, I think it's in uh, M M two data transfer. It's four, yeah, yeah. So once the uh, uh, go up, one slide up, uh, where the sequence diagram is there, yeah. So once the data push, so this is something that we have demonstrated that you would get a health information request and you would respond it to the gateway with on request and then you would prepare the data. We have talked about in detail on how you would prepare the data, how does like fire work and how to encrypt it. And then you would push uh, using the direct data transfer, the data push URL. And once the data has been pushed, the HIP would, uh, or the HRP would hit the health information slash notify with a particular body, it's on the, if you can scroll down. Yeah, with uh, yeah, with notification, consent ID, of course there are other parts to uh, this and uh, this should be present in the uh, Postman collection. With status notification and status responses indicating like all the entries that you've sent have been successfully uh, transferred to. If you receive 200 from uh, the data push URL, that means we have the data push URL, uh, whoever is at the end of the data push URL has acknowledged the receipt of these things. And uh, uh, that is the notify call. And uh, with this until now, I think we have covered every API that is required for you uh, to be certified as, uh, to be certified with M2. And uh, now, now that we have, we also, I want to quickly, if you can escape uh, to the main view, zoom out view. I would also want to like sort of uh, uh, stress on the fact that we've also covered major chunk of M3 without actually specifying that it's M3. Like the data preparation, once you understand what the fire entails, it becomes easier for you to pass also when you receive it as. And similarly for Fidelia CLI, while we were covering Fidelia CLI generally as a tool, uh, just the way Ranveer has used the encryption side of things, he will demonstrate the decryption of it. But uh, 
uh, it works similarly. So we have covered the um, majority of the chunk of the M3 also. Let's uh, conclude that with the uh, actual data transfer happening as a part of M3. So now uh, if you can scroll down to the next slide. So in M3, so what we have seen in M2 is the, uh, the HIP receives the request and then it sends the request uh, forward. Uh, yes, Nidhiji, you can get the slides uh, at the end of this, like uh, NHA will share it with you publicly. Uh, so the M3 starts, this is where there is an HIU which is requesting the data and that is the reason why the HIP got the request. So this is where we see that end of it, wherein there is an HIU and you you would have seen the interface version of it from the HIU portal when Ranveer created a consent. This is the API that you would hit as an HIU where you would hit the consent hyphen request slash in it. And again, in the consent, you would specify the purpose of it. Uh, again, like purpose is uh, multifold. It has various reasons. It has been well-documented on the side. Please go read it. And then you would add the patient with the particular ID. And there are other uh, uh, things that you would send. You would also send the HI types, uh, whether you need an uh, OP consult, uh, prescription, wellness record, immunization record. What, what sort of HI types are you looking for? And then the permission thing, uh, which specifies the date range between which you want the health records for the patient for. And, uh, uh, and then like uh, you would uh, move forward with the uh, call, you would get the consent request slash on in it back with uh, the particular with a particular consent request ID. And in here, uh, I just want to also stress on the fact that headers may to specify that uh, a particular facility is being hit, you get the XHIU ID and you can use this to verify that you are the intended recipient for this particular call. And once you receive the consent request ID, we move uh, further down. Uh, the like ABDM would hit the HIU notify with the particular notification with all the consent artifacts that are present uh, under that particular notification. And all these consent artifacts are clubbed under a single consent request ID, right? And uh, HRP would hit the on notify call with the acknowledgement that uh, yes, that uh, these have been uh, these have been received. Uh, can you scroll down, please? And uh, what the HRP would then do is it would fetch the consents for all the consent IDs that are that have been received in the uh, past step. And uh, like once the in in on fetch, the ABDM would return back all the consents that have been. Uh, that have been uh, hit with the consent slash fetch. Once you receive these consents, then uh, the HRP would send the request with the HI request, uh, similar to the HI request that we have seen on the HIP and where HIP was on the receiving end. Here, the, uh, the HIU is on the sending end where it would generate key material. It would use the consent. It would send the, it would uh, give the date range and the data push URL. It, these are all the things that the, uh, HIU generates. And once it sends it as a part of the request, it would sort of get it back on request. And uh, uh, that should be CM slash CM on request. Uh, and once you do get it the uh, in, in this particular sequence flow, uh, you would get the, like whatever data push URL you have specified, the HIV would send the data on that data push URL. And just as we have seen in the notify call in HIP, the HIU is also supposed to send it back saying that, yes, I have received this data. So that is uh, in, in the entirety, the flow of it. Now let's see this in action um, uh, as a demonstration when we over to you. All right. Um, so I'm gonna go back to Postman and um, just, yeah, so as I said, this is the flip side of what we just showed with the HIP. We're going to do the HIU side of things now. Um, so the APIs, uh, as I discussed in the theory, are these APIs you can see on the left. Uh, so the first, the first thing you have to do is initiate the consent request. So what we are doing with this API, uh, actually this, this, for this particular API is what we did with the HIU web interface. So it is, we will be performing the same function, but we're going to be doing it via an API now. So um, 
let me just generate the uh, authentication token again and uh, so in the in the uh, body of the consent request in it api call we have the consent uh, attribute with the purpose uh, purpose object and that uh, that that you can it can be any of the um, the ones you saw in the drop down of the hiu web interface with self request state care management uh, emergency so there were a bunch so it can be any of those uh, patient uh, you have to send obviously you have to send the id so i'm going to send the same id that uh, we had uh, we've been using so far today hiu uh, we're going to be using the facility id in the uh, that uh, the same facility id abdm workshop uh, if you remember at the beginning of the workshop today when we registered the facility we gave it both the hip and the hiu role that is why i'm able to use this facility even to demonstrate the hiu side of things and request uh, you have to give um, some sort of an entity or a particular doctor so uh, the detail this has been well documented in the abdm documentation as well as what you can send in the identifier field uh, for the purposes we've kind of uh, used this doctor's name with a uh, with a with a dummy uh, registration identifier uh, the hi types again for we will be requesting op consultation for the purpose of this demonstration Uh, but you can it's an array the hi types is an array so you can send in um you, you can send in how many ever you want and uh, you can then op consultation discharge summary and um any of the seven and uh, and permission again you have to enter a valid date range uh, and uh, so we can do that let's uh, let's make it till the 30th of or let's make it till yesterday actually we want the data from today so let's make it Today and uh, let's make the expiry sometime in the future, and um, and uh, one thing to note is headers again. We have to send the authorization token and the XCM ID. So um, I'm going to hit the init API. We've got a two zero two accepted, and uh, we if I go back to the pipe dream, we should get an on in it. and uh it looks like it's uh, there's no errors and uh, if i share my phone screen we should be able to see the consent over there give me one second i'm just sharing my phone screen I hey, don't so my phone screen is visible you can see on top over here Dr Saurabh Tripathi was the uh, name of the doctor who we used to generate this consent request so the consent has showed up and as the patient now uh, once again i have to accept the consent or grant the consent and i'm going to go ahead and do that and uh, once i do that you can see uh, let me switch back now so you can see my other screen yeah so once i if my screen is visible now you can see that we've received two notify calls uh now just to uh, provide some context over here one of the notify so the notify calls as i mentioned before go um uh, sorry one is the hiu notify the hiu notify is sent uh, as i mentioned by the gateway to the hiu uh indicating that the consent has been granted so if you look at the notification it says state is granted and there are two consent artifacts that are generated uh one thing to note is there is one consent artifact that is generated for each hip that the, uh, where the data for that patient exists um now to provide some context over here you saw me link the data with one hip which was this workshop demo hip so that's one artifact accounting for the other one i had already linked this uh, this particular abh id with another hip with the hip that was provided to us by nha to use as a as an external hip to our um, uh, for the purposes of this demonstration so the second consent artifact is for that particular hip um so um that's why uh, i mean this isn't part of this demonstration but that's why if you see we received one hip notify because in this case one of the hips over here is us so that is why I, and that hip is registered with this particular url although we won't be using this call at all we will be uh, we will be performing the m3 uh, data transfer using the um, the external hip that i was telling so um 
in what happens next is once we get the notify call, we are supposed to uh, respond with an on notify. So in the on notify, the body is an acknowledgement array with a status okay and a consent ID. So we're going to be taking the consent ID. Um, we're going to be taking the consent ID, and uh, that's uh, that the consent request ID, and we'll paste it here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to copy the consent artifact ID. That's my bad. So uh, we will only be responding to um, the one uh, to the external HIP, not 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 our own, because that's the one I'm doing the demonstration with. And we also have to provide a uh, provide a request ID. As you can see, the acknowledgement is an array, and uh, you are acknowledging against all the consent artifacts. So consent request, whenever you think of it, is a club of consent artifacts, and we acknowledge for a particular uh, artifact. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so that's been accepted. The and the next step is to fetch uh, the fetch API, and we have to fetch it against again a particular consent artifact. So once again, so the number of consent artifacts that you get, those are the number of times you will have to hit this API. So that, for example, if we were, if we wanted uh, all of the data, like if we wanted the data linked to both of these consent artifacts, we would have had to hit this API twice. But again, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm just going to be. Um, I'm just going to be uh, hitting it once and getting the data for the uh, for the external HIP that we are using. And uh, so this we we've, we've got a two zero two accepted, uh, and I should have received a call back and on fetch. Um, and in the consent, we can see uh, the consent detail. And uh, just to check, the HIP is this BFHL HIP, which with this particular. Uh, uh, name. So you, you can see this is an external HIP. This is not ours was called demo workshop, uh, ABDM demo workshop. So, uh, we've fetched the consent details. And, uh, once we've received this, we have to hit the, we have to generate the request call now. Um, now this is the, uh, like arguably the most important step in the data transfer, because this is where we, uh, where we generate the key material and, uh, and, and, and send it to the HIP. So that they can encrypt and send us the data, and where we specify the data push URL. So first things first, we need to we need to give context and provide the consent ID against which we're uh, requesting the data. So um, we're gonna copy this value from the on fetch call, and we will paste it here. After that, we specify the date range. Um, so the um, the date range uh, we will use what we uh, had for um, what we specified in the init call. So um, let me just really quickly see what that was. Uh, was... Yeah. So once we have the date range, we will also specify the data push URL. So the data push URL I've specified is the is the pipe dream uh, callback URL we're using slash data slash push. So um, of course this will depend on your your particular HIU's uh, URL and where you want the data to be received. After that we have to generate the key material. So for this I'm going to switch back to Fidelius and we will generate um, we will generate a new set of key materials for this purpose. So um, I'm going to use the GKM command again, and we have a new set of key materials now. And uh, from this, we need the nonce, and we also need the public key. So I'm going to copy paste, copy these two things to send. Um, so over here, the DH public key, we will copy paste into this key value attribute. And um, we also need the nonce which I have in my clipboard. So I'm going to paste that here. And with that, I think we have uh, everything we need to make this request call. Uh, just once again, um, to reiterate, the headers have, have to have both the authorization and the XCM ID because this call is going via the gateway to the HIP. So when I hit uh, when I hit this API, we get a two zero two accepted, and after this, uh, we should get an on request call, which is just the gateway acknowledging our request, and we can see the HIP has 
in fact push the data at the slash data slash push url so if i expand the entries array we can see the care context reference we can see the uh, we can see the content has also been sent this is the encrypted data that the hip has in fact sent us um and i think as i had mentioned most facilities we are interacting with, interacting with and have not been using the checksum properly so you can see they have not sent a proper checksum um but uh, and they were they, and we can also see send their key materials we have their public key and their non so we have everything we need to decrypt the data so i'm going to go ahead and do that using fidelius again so what i need to do is i need to copy the content so i'm going to copy the encrypted data and i also um need their public key and i also need their nonce right so these are the three things that i um need to decrypt the data so i'm going to go back to fidelius and once again we are going to be using the file path command um so we need to generate a text file so i'm going to generate a text file called decryption params and let's open it so we have this um now similar to what we did for encryption the first thing has to be the command so that should be decrypt this is going to be followed by the data so uh the encrypted data so um so i'm going to go ahead and paste that um then after that it's it 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 has to be the nonces so um so i'm going to um copy the nonces uh just to be sure i'm going to take it from here again uh i'm going to paste their nonces then i'm then we're going to have to paste our nonces which we generated using the gkm command so that we can get from here and and the last thing uh, the, then we need our private key so again that we generated using fidelius so we're going to get that from here and we also need their public key which we will get from the api call once again which is a key value and once i paste this we have everything we need uh in the text file so i'm going to go and close that and i'm going to come back here and run the same command that i ran to encrypt it uh which is the file with the file path flag and uh it's the the i'm going to give the name of the text file which is decryption params the txt and the data has been decrypted if i scroll all the way to the top right so you can see the decrypted data is here you can see it's in proper file format resource type bundle id everything is there uh what i'm going to do is so the way this particular hip has sent the data they've used the binary method so what you see over here is the base 64 for the pdf so what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh i'm going to pipe this data into my pv copy and then i'm going to show it to you using json hero just so everyone can see um yeah so i've copied it i'm going to just really quickly paste it over here and right i'm going to um one so i just want i just i, I just want the data just so i just want so i had to remove that decrypted thing and as we can see over here we can see that it's uh, formatted it into a proper file format if i click on the code you can see it's a proper file bundle with the resource type uh in the entry you can see the composition is the first entry uh they have given a subject reference they've given a patient uh, they've given a practitioner reference and uh and you can see the in the entries array there is a binary and if we scroll down to the bundle the binary bundle we can see the data the data has the base 64 of the pdf they specified its pdf and the data has the base 64 of the pdf so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use a base 64 to um pdf a uh, converter to show you that um that this is in fact a valid pdf uh right so as you can see over here this pdf uh is valid you can see my name uh and uh, the the consultation details chief complaints that we didn't put it the temperature or the medicines prescribed 
So the data transfer again from the HIU's point of view was also successful. The decryption worked using Fidelius, and um, I think that uh, that completes the decryption demonstration, the data transfer uh, demonstration for the HIU as well. Thanks. Yeah. We can go back to the uh, yeah. presentation. So, uh, Skip. Yeah. Yeah. I just go back to the zoomed out. Skip. Yeah. So that has been uh, the workshop, uh, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, we will take questions shortly. But uh, uh, just to summarize that these are all the flows that are required again, like uh, with the data transport. One thing that we have not demonstrated, but which is very straightforward is the notify call. Once the, uh, once the HIU request, uh, receives the request, uh, the HIU would hit that particular notify call. Again, it's a part of, if you go back to the postman once like that, the data receipt notification, uh, exactly same as the, uh, probably you can copy this URL and also uh, update the data push notification. Just copy the URL. Ah, yes, yes. Yeah. Gateway is misspelled. Even in the data receipt notification. So it's exactly the same as the data push notification, wherein uh, once you, at, in the case of HIP, when the HIP sends it, it would send a notification back to the gateway. And in case of HIU, it would ex hit the exact, in the exact same way, but as a, you can see the notifier type is HIU and data received notification. So that in its entirety cover uh, the entire ground of APIs that are required for you to be certified uh, with M2 and M3. And uh, now let's uh, give the give some ground to, for questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. Hello, I have one question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so it was told key in this, uh, while creating the consent request, we have to use the UTC time format. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, but while fetching the request now, Let's say as a patient, if I'm trying to fetch my all the requests using the request API, it is returning the time like created at time in the IST format. So there is a mismatch. Okay, it depends on the yeah, it depends on the facility also. Probably uh, on on the HIP that is sending the because HIP request is a part of uh, uh, the the data is a part of the object and uh, facilities generate the date. You can also probably add some checks on how you handle dates. So then you can handle a mismatch and dates because the, the format is, uh, is is clear to you. No, no, it is not about the HIP. It is, for example, let's say uh, yeah. HIP did not come into a picture yet. Let's say as a HIU, we created the consent request to fetch uh, the data or something. And at okay. that time, we also, in the timestamp, uh, we provided the UTC time format. But mm -hmm. as a patient, when I'm trying to fetch all my consents, now, it is mm -hmm. returning me created at in the uh, IST format. That's what I'm saying. That even if it's fetching in ISC format, you can handle it, uh, right? Based on there, there can be a date library which can handle these things for you, uh, based on if the time zone is there or not there. It has to be handled on your end. Okay, but there is no fixed format. Huh? That means uh, in which format will be coming? Uh, there is a fixed format. The fetch thing they are supposed to send as per the as per the documentation. If it is being a blocker for you, please post it on the forum saying that this is what is expected, but it's being sent in this particular way. If you're not able to handle, if for any reason your system is not able to hand, handle that uh, change. No, we have also posted in the dev form. If you want, I have just pasted the uh, dev form ticket here in the chat also. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Hi, uh, this is Praveen from my representative Star Health Insurance. Uh, 
I see, probably... we have uh, a, a, a network of uh, 14,000 hospitals and a lot of labs, and we are also venturing into OPD. Okay. So, uh, if we play the HRP role, uh, can we cover for any of these providers who want to leverage the facility? If we, Can we be the AVDM complaint on behalf of them? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks. So, um, Sai, this is Hari here again. Um, so, we are um, a multi product company. And uh, in fact, the EMRs also, we have many uh, EMRs. So, um, the, the strategy we are taking is to have an ABDM uh, management layer as a, a microservices application, right? So, um, for the purposes of certification, would it be okay to stop the uh, you know uh, data transmission and things like that, and then just showcase the flows through this ABDM microservice? Would that suffice, or do we really require the integration with our uh, core systems? Uh, integration would be required with the facility for sure, uh, because without that, because what you are whenever you are submitting it for a certification, you are submitting it not only just the uh, the HRP part of things, but also with a particular facility. And then how you can take that certification and serve with the same HRP for other facilities is something uh, that you would uh, obviously uh, establish a dialogue with the, with the NHA team. Uh, but for the first certification process, from my understanding, you would have to uh, do it in a complete way. Because right now, I think uh, the even for the testing, there are uh, third-party uh, companies which are... The, uh, which would do the like testing integration testing for you and they would require for you to uh, uh, pass all the test cases with a particular facility integrated including creating a facility and like and that facility need not be uh, a real facility as long as you are creating a facility and ensuring that the whole data flows uh, uh, follow the given set of apis for both m2 and m3 Right, so I can still create a dummy facility as part of the sandbox process and then still showcase the workflow. That's what you're uh, saying, right? Absolutely, everything is dummy in SPX. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so just to follow up that time bala issue, it is not uh, coming for subscription request. It is just coming for uh, consent request only. Okay, so okay, yeah. yeah. It would be good if you can look at uh, your end or can provide some less passive for when it would be easy for us. Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Are there any more queries? Uh, if not, then we can close the session. Any more queries from any participants, please? Mm, yeah, hello. Yeah, actually, I want to know for M3 API implementation, will I follow AVA ID validation flow or uh, directly will follow M3? It depends on, uh, so for M3 flow, you uh, the validation is just to ensure that the, uh, the AVA ID is valid. You are not going to use the access token linking token for any further flow. So uh, ideally, it is recommended that you go the M2 way first and then the M3 way. But if your use case is that you're directly building M3, uh, then yes, you would have to uh, also do the validation part as a part of the requirement of M3. Okay, 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 thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is this any way to uh, particularly uh, the, uh, I got, I, if I receive J JSON, FHR to uh, convert it into object or uh, FHR object. Is this uh, is there any way? Sorry, uh, is there any I... way to uh, to convert JSON uh, object? Uh, sorry, JSON string into JSON object. Uh, sorry, but, uh, means FHR JSON. I'm talking about F FHR JSON. Fire JSON. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah, you would have to build a. Uh... Uh, functionality in your at, at the at the end of your uh, facility in your HIMS to fetch the data that you have. For example, if you're building a patient resource, you would uh, fetch all the requisite uh, patient data. And based on the definitions that have been given uh, in the 
and our CES website and the way uh, we have covered in the in the slides on you can compose and create a bundle. The function can return uh, different resources and then you can compose those resources together to form the bundle as uh, per the definition as per the profiles that have been given in uh, uh, in the NRCS website. Okay. Uh, so uh, one more question. So regarding the data transfer, na, like for all the uh, callback request, we are getting uh, a token and we can validate uh, whether this request is coming from ABDM or not. But regarding the data transfer, when HIP is pushing the data, sometimes they push uh, the uh, token or something in the headers, but uh, all HIPs are not pushing. So how can we validate? Is there any uh, mechanism by which we can validate at gateway level whether this request is valid other than the checking the encryption and decryption are you are the, you uh, looking it from the hiv perspective or the hiu perspective i am looking at the hiu perspective when hip is pushing the data how yeah. can we validate uh, like whether this data is pushed by correct hip i mean so, the way yeah the way I, we, we can validate all the callback request ki ha, these callbacks requests are coming from the uh, abdm is there any similar mechanism for checking ki this request is coming from proper hip or not no you have to validate it based on the data you receive on based on the data structure that you receive because there are no specifications on like what headers to follow uh based on the care context reference and based on uh, uh, uh things that are present as a part of the entry bundle uh, because in the inside the entry uh, you would have the facility like what is the facility and all that so that is more or less a, an open invitation for you to receive data for that particular patient so in the fire format you will have certain specification on where you are getting the data from based on that you have to uh, uh, just having, uh, one quick follow-up on that you you get a transaction id as part of the data push so that uh, has to match the transaction id you get in the on request yeah. So you have to validate that. All right. Yeah. I thought is if there any mechanism by which we can validate at gateway level because to validate the transaction ID we have to process the uh, like the request at the DB level or somewhere. Of course. Yeah. I mean. Okay, thanks. Yeah. You can, you don't need to technically process. Yeah, I mean, like for a transaction ID to, uh, for you to verify if it's there, then uh, that is something that you have to look. If it's not matching, then you can just discard that request. Right. right. The DB level thing as has been mentioned uh, before, it is imperative that you establish that chain. Otherwise it doesn't really make sense for the HRP to exist, to uh, perform like continued, uh, 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 like uh, the callback event for transition at the end it is processing at the queue, queue type event this might also happen but Sorry? we will be having the data that's so correct we call, right did you get my yeah. point yeah, yeah that's correct so, so we cannot implement that validation why can't I mean, we implement the validation sorry because uh, because it is processing queue wise not something so let's say if abdm event comes later than the data which hip has pushed this can ha also happen this scenario na? like HIP can push like it is at the end. No, uh, generally the race events, we, again, like race events have been something that we've also looked at, but uh, race events generally don't happen in this particular context. But uh, if you face a particular race event in this condition, I'm curious to look at it. Yeah. Uh, you, you can, you can sort of put, uh, post it on dev forum uh, and you yeah. can tag me. Okay. Yeah, this has never happened. I think we must have requested the data a lot of times. The on request has always come before yeah. uh, the data push. So, I mean, yeah, like so I said, if so, that happens, then that would be interesting to look at. But it has because, not uh, because the gateway is also involved in this. Right. The on right. Request. right. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Then I think we can implement something like Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, then we can close the session. Sai, Ranveer, are we good to go ahead? Close this. Yeah, for sure, Minakshi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. It's been an extremely Hello. enlightening session. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks yes, somebody Thank wanted to speak something. Somebody has a question. Just want to thank Ranveer and Sai. It, uh, it oh, was yeah. a very. Definitely. Thanks.
intense and now uh, good session definitely thank you thank, thank you. you guys thank you sai thank you ravi thank you have a great day gentlemen and have a great weekend bye bye thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.